Mark. Thank you, Mark. Uh, let me say uh, that's Mark Saggers coming up uh, with the Sunday night club. Um, Isla Lones, thank you so much. Isla, Carla Battisti, again, thank you. Finley Knowles, Jack Thurbrun and Deborah Brown have been part of the team. Have a great week. I will see you right here next Saturday and Sunday. Uh, in the meantime, do look after yourselves and stay tuned for the wonderful Mark Saggers. That's coming up next here on Talk. Uh This is Talk TV. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4 pm, only on Talk, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and you're on your smart speaker. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Nice. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. <laughs> Boom, fantastic. We need a bit more of that in the UK. I can't wait to hear Liz Truss say something like that. She's saying what a lot of people think. Not if you can't then... call Hamas terrorists, I can't talk to you. Cut the interview. Fine. Goodbye. He had a uh, politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks. It said yeah. nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent, that's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way, couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? You've been having to fight again for compensation after having to fight to be believed, then fight to get your conviction quashed, to get what's rightfully yours. If Archetypes was as successful as they claim, why is Spotify that paid Harry and Meghan a significant amount of money to produce 13 episodes in total, including the Christmas special, willing to hand that over to Limonade? to do whatever they want with it. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, huh? know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you> <laughs> yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. There are no banners calling for and the re release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no Hamas. banners, Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march where we no, condemn no, Hamas. Sorry, no, I'm yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you can't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth is going on in the House of Commons? I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. Richard Sunak should have brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special right. counsel. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh, <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> Your <laughs> mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a cow. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on talk TV. Very good evening to you. Welcome to the Sunday Night Club, Liverpool Football Club, the quadruple. It's still on. It was a last-minute winner by Virgil van Dijk in extra time that beat Chelsea today. We'll be talking about that game very shortly. We'll also be looking ahead to Maidenhead's game tomorrow night against Coventry City in the FA Cup with an opportunity for a non-league side so far down the pyramid to reach the quarterfinals of the competition. More on that to come as well. And um, we've got a special middle hour. Keith Hackett will be joining us. Mark Halsey, Steve Chitterton, and of course the great rugby referee as uh, well, who uh, really has been about the best we've ever seen over many years. Nigel Owens joins us for our middle hour. As far as the cricket is concerned, it's all really going India's way again and uh, Neil Burns will be with us to uh, sort all of that out and uh, we've got George Shooter amongst others when it comes to the Six Nations. Uh, you're very much part of all of this as well, we'd like you to text us and uh, if you get the opportunity to do that 87222 at Talk TV at Mark Saggers on the X app right now. Well, good evening. I'm going to start today not with the football and the final, uh, the, uh, the uh, EFL Cup final at Wembley, but with news, sad news, of two footballers from a different generation who've both uh, died over the weekend. Chris Nicholl, who was the Aston Villa centre-half, uh, played uh, some magnificent games in the 70s. I guess at some stage he probably will also have... Um, been defending against the great Stan Bowles and it's Stan Bowles the former Queen's Park Rangers star played five times for England should perhaps have played many more times that we're going to start the show with tonight not because for many Stan Bowles was just another footballer because he was anything but that he had everything when it came to skill on the pitch and off the pitch well he was one of us, really. He liked more than just the odd flutter. He liked to have a party, and he liked very much just to enjoy it. He was very serious about his footballer, but it wasn't absolutely everything. My God, he was good. He was really good. How he only played five games for England, well, that'll be down to any sort of politics, because might not have been quite the right sort of player for the Blazers. But he was for all of us, and certainly for Queen's Park Rangers fans. And for Tony Incenso. Tony has a photograph signed by Stan Bowles in his office. He posted today a photograph of the two of them. And it's going to be difficult for Tony to talk tonight about Stan Bowles, because he was very close to him. And I guess your favourite... Queen's Park Rangers player of all time. Tony, good evening. Good evening, Mark. Really, really sad to have to talk about this. Um, but let's celebrate the, the life and career of Stanley Bowles. He was the best footballer I ever saw live. He's the reason why, as a, a young child growing up in northwest London, the reason why I support Queen's Park Rangers, the reason why generations of people support QPR. He's left a legacy at the club. He was a magician on the pitch. He had a an outstanding left foot. He could score a goal. He could create chances. And off the field, he was larger than life. At a time when, in the 1970s, Mark, footballers and, and rock stars mixed together and football was rock and roll. And as you said, Stan loved a party. He liked a drink. He liked a cigarette. And he loved gambling. So on and off the field, uh, an absolute legend. He was really, and uh, you know, looking back on, on his life today, you, you perhaps forget in a way that... He came from the northwest, from Manchester. He wasn't actually uh, a London lad, but he very much acted like one. Yeah, he started off at Manchester City, didn't he? And then he went to Crewe and Carlisle before he came down to London in 1972. He signed for QPR and uh, he became part of that great Queen's Park Rangers side of the mid-1970s that almost won the league. Mm. It's unbelievable to, to even reflect on this now. QPR were 
a point away from winning the league in 1975-76 and Liverpool pipped Rangers in the final game of the season. It was just unbelievable. But the manager was Dave Sexton and he played a, a pure style of continental passing football, a rotational football where players would drop back while other players went forward. And, and Sexton used to go and watch the great teams. We didn't see foreign football on the TV then. So Sexton would fly out every Sunday to Germany or Holland to watch the great Borussia Mönchengladbach or the great Ajax teams. And he'd have this passing football, which really suited Stanley Bowles. And, and, and Stan had a great partnership and a great uh, understanding with Jerry Francis, who was the England captain. Amazing to think that Queen's Park Rangers had the England captain at the time and, and had five players in the England team at one point, including Stanley Bowles. And that 75-76 side, the greatest team never to win the league, and Stan Bowles was the star player. He was. I mean, we mentioned uh, at the beginning there he only had five international caps. He, you know, the, the, the Blazers wouldn't uh, have thought perhaps he was their sort of man, which is very sad, really, because he could have been something special as part of anything with England then. Absolutely. It was different. There were different times. In those days, there were all sorts of maverick players, weren't there? Every club almost had one. And it was a really exciting time to be a football fan. And you could um, you could appreciate the maverick players at other clubs. You could admire people like Leighton James. You could admire people like Tony Curry, like Charlie George, like Frank Worthington. You know, you, you it wouldn't even be a secret admiration. You would admire them as a general football fan. Nowadays, I don't think that would happen because there's so much banter and people ridiculing each other and running down different clubs on Twitter. Uh, but in those days, you respected those Maverick players, and Stan Bowles was much loved. If you look at all the tributes being paid to him, there are thousands of tributes to him online today from people who support all different clubs. And they say, oh, I was a Leeds fan, or I was a Manchester United fan, but I used to love seeing Stan Bowles come to play against my club. And there were great times in the 1970s where there were these outstanding mavericks all around the country and everybody could appreciate them. Yeah, I mean, the the, the gambling, of course, uh, gets carried away with at times uh, in the stories. But the great line, of course, uh, from I think it was one of his early managers uh, that he, um, he, could, he gave a swift retort to as well when he said if uh, only Stanley um, could... Uh, pass a bookies as well as he could pass a football, he'd still have been a multi-millionaire. Yeah, I think it was Joe Mercer who said that, and it, it was true. I mean, Queen's Park Rangers in those days, you'd have a big game, end of the season, to win the league. 30,000 people turning up to watch Rangers play Leeds United, last game of the season. And Dave Sexton would look around the dressing room and say, where's Stan? Where's Stan? And Stan was in the betting shop around the corner until 10 to 3 in his full kit. He'd come in, get changed, put on his blue and white hoot, and then go into the betting shop till 10 to 3. And he didn't have a, a warm-up. He didn't have the, the, the professional warm-up they have now with all the fitness coaches. His warm-up was in the betting shop. And then he'd come in and he'd go up straight out onto the pitch and he'd run rings around the opposition and score the winning goal. It was unbelievable. Brilliant, Tony. That's exactly the way I want to remember him. And thank you very much indeed for paying tribute to one of your great friends as well. Stanley Bowles, who died at the age of 75. Chris Nicholl also died uh, in his 70s as well this weekend uh, both of them from dementia no mention of football and dementia perhaps there should be as well and certainly again i just want to nudge people towards things like the astel foundation and how we must keep up the momentum to help those who've lost footballers at all different levels uh, because probably for heading a football Let's start uh, now and look at back at what was the first of the cup finals of this season. It was the EFL at Wembley and uh, it's Liverpool against Chelsea. Chelsea, who've had a nightmare season under new ownership. Somehow they've managed to get to the final up against Liverpool, who are now under Jurgen Klopp in his final season. They still have this opportunity of the quadruple to come with uh, uh, the Europa League still in the FA Cup playing again this week. And, of course, uh, very much involved with the Premier League. Today, it was the very last minutes of extra time that decided it. A goal from Virgil van Dijk. Both had chances. Both missed chances. In the end, would, did Liverpool deserve it? I guess they probably did. Uh, let's talk to uh, Lee Phillips, who's the Liverpool podcaster, and to Jonathan Kidd, who's the Chelsea fancaster. Lee... Well, the, the, the first of four, really. Um, a decent enough game today. One or two little bits and pieces and moments of controversy. But um, in the end, 
as Liverpool can tend to do on these occasions, just somehow finding a way to get it done. Yeah, I'm unbelievable. Really, really happy with today's result and the way it went. Um, I mean, as you see, we were kind of, if I'm honest, I felt that we were in control at the beginning of the game. Then that that tackle on um on on, on Graven back there, it, it kind of kind of Chelsea then got into the game again. I mean, as I was just so impressed. I'm just so impressed with the way this team has been going about their business. When the youngsters come in, they do a job like, and it, I think in the end it was probably well deserved because Chelsea actually towards the end looked finished. They were run out. They run out of puff. It looked like they were ready for the penalties. If you had said to me at the start of the extra time, would you take penalties? I'd have said, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I completely understand that. And just one for, for more for you before we speak to uh, Jonathan and bring in him as well here. Um, mm -hmm. For me, this now bringing on this beginning of the next ge generation of Liverpool, I think will be as much Jurgen Klopp's legacy as anything else. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> wow. I mean, he's leaving now, but to leave us in such a good position is it doesn't normally happen. Generally, when managers leave, they leave on the on the back of being sacked or something. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the team's left in a bad way. But the way the team's being left now is pff, we're in really good shape. So, hopefully, we get the right man in, um, and he doesn't want to make too many changes. And look, I can't see anything else but good things, man. Jonathan, join the uh, conversation. Good evening to you. Uh, I'd love to say it was great to be here, but I'm uh, <laughs> Im 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 immensely depressed by the experience. I, I can uh, I can imagine, and we we've all been there on varying different occasions. Um, I've rushed back from Wembley. I've just got back to the computer here. It's just yeah. the run in. Totally you know what? You, you had you had your opportunities. Oh, we should have won it in the last ten minutes of the, of, uh, of normal time. Chance after chance after chance, and then he he brings the youth team on, and it's embarrassing. It was an embarrassing second half display. We didn't get into the Liverpool half for the first ten minutes of extra time, mm -hmm. and he's got he brought Mudrick on, who has the brain of a whelk. I'm afraid a football brain. I'm sorry to be so rude. He is right. really not good enough. Good enough in that environment, and and it's almost as if they were playing for extra time. I think I think you were just saying, weren't you, that yeah. that it looked, they both looked exhausted, except Liverpool did it less exhausted because all the youth were on, and the, the Van Dyke header he'd already scored that when it was disallowed for offside. Who was marking him? The mistakes that they make, Disasti was absolutely disaster area for the whole of the game. Epp being caught in possession. Why on earth, when Liverpool play so tight and rely heavily on the ball being punched down the, the, the pitch to run after it, do they not do the same? Why do they play short all the time? It is a recipe for disaster. How did Gallagher miss so many chances in front of goal? Why take a touch over oh, the days of Viali or Hasselbank? There's the goal. Bap. It's in. Mm. What? I am in despair watching this team. They cannot hit a cow's ass with a banjo. They are absolutely dreadful when it comes to shooting. Mm. Oh, my goodness me. Oh, well, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned with all of these things, and I feel your passion and I feel your pain as well ah, here as well. There's no, there's, there's, there's so no, no doubt ab ah. about this. And just before I come back it's to Liverpool, sixth, I mean... It's the sixth time we've lost in a cup final. Yeah, well, I, I know and well, but, you know, the, the, there's this other sort of weird thing about Chelsea at the moment, of course, because of new owners and uh, different ways of trying to do things and uh, Pochettino <laughs> somehow in the middle of all of this. Um, do the fans really know where the club is going? No, no, but they're all talking about what a lovely day out we had. They're not talking about the football. When that takes over, you know the club's in a, in a terrible state when we're talking about, well, I had a nice time in the pub with my mates. And that's what's happening now. They've got, they have no idea. We don't know which team's turning up. This, this was the team today that couldn't shoot. The last, first 20 <laughs> minutes, funny enough, they were the team that could, just gave the ball away all the time. For, whatever, for all over us, 20 minutes. They just press. Has Pochettino not told them that how you deal with people teams pressing, you play the ball long. I, don't, I feel, you know, I should be earning £450,000 a week. I seem to know more than he does. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm in despair. I, I, we just watch the same rubbish. Often It's either one team that can't deal with it, or suddenly one week they actually turn up. Palace was a great example the other day, where they played one shot on goal in the whole of the first half. Second half, they're excellent. What happened? What happened to their brains? What happened their mentality? I, I mean, we are all aghast at what is happening with the club. We keep saying, would it be nice to have a striker up there who actually can put the ball in the net? You feel that might might actually achieve, might solve several issues. The yeah. number of times the ball is in the penalty area. Where was that wonderful moment in the last few minutes before extra time came where the ball pinged around three times and hit about four different sets of heels and nobody put the ball in the net? We're all going, yeah, 
oh, but, and then part of us just we all go, oh well, it's them. We just accept it, really, don't we? Yeah. But it, it's just so it's it's embarrassing. I take the extra time losing to the youth team. What was Pochettino thinking? Well, I, I, we'll I, ask I, Liverpool about can't. that youth team again as well. Now, um, Jonathan, I understand your frustrations, and I understand that. Sorry, I'm not, I'm, it's, it's not very. Uh, it's, it's where could I put it? It's, it's not terribly um, measured analysis. I don't expect it? measured but, analysis from a from a, a fan who's just come back from uh, Wembley. Thank you very much. Good. So don't, <laughs> worry, don't worry about that as well. Actually, uh, Lee, though, I mean, you've now got so much still to look forward to, having got that one out of the way. Yeah, yeah, we have, and I, I'm just hoping that we can use it um, as a catalyst to like kick off the rest of the season. Um, I mean, we're, we're managing in the league okay, um, kind of convincing in our wins and stuff, really. Uh, Wednesday is next with Southampton. <laughs> it's like looking forward to these games because I just think, what kind of team are we going to put out? What team's going to be available to be put out? And how are they going to play in that game? Like, it's exciting, it really yeah. is. Well, look, uh, it's a good place to finish there. Exciting for Liverpool, uh, exasperating for Chelsea. We're going to be speaking. Word. Wolves. Perfect word. We're going to be speaking Wolves against Sheffield United next on the Sunday Night Club. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Nice. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, but it said nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent, that's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? <laughs> What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know what's uh, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for the re release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no banners, mass. Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march where we can't say everyone on that march. Sorry, no, I'm yeah. sorry. I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you no, can't. Fine. Good. I'm, no, so I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth? is going on in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. Richard Soon actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advising you on a special case. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> my your <God>. mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Well, continuing our football now, there was uh, one Premier League game today. Uh, let's visit it. Much better for Wolves than it was uh, once more for Sheffield United, who are in uh, all sorts of uh, problems right now. Good evening to Dan Hughes and to Johnny Gascoigne. Uh, Dan, I'll come to you first, if I may. 
uh, you know, it was a, a decent performance. You wouldn't say it was an outstanding performance today at all, would you? But what you would say is that you got the job done for the first time at uh, in the league this season with a win at home at Molyneux. And Gary O'Neill's side, you know, you, you, you're doing it in the right way now, whatever, whatever anybody else says. And uh, don't even think yet about not thinking about a possibility of Europe. Yeah, even Sagas, yeah, today was all about getting the three points, whether it was by hook or crook. I mean, Johnny will be disappointed because Sheffield United were the better team the majority of that game. Uh, but one one piece of quality has won the game today because the rest of the game, both sides were really lacking quality for the majority of it. Tell us about that header then from uh, Sarabia. I mean, he's not the sort of... Um, uh, he wouldn't be one of my main Wolves players, I'd suggest, would be, um, you know, scoring a header... Uh, with a late one into the box, but yeah, I, Ryan Aitnor is a special talent, um, and he, he's put it on a tenpence for him. And uh, obviously, their keeper has uh, got no chance of that. It was, it was a great header, Johnny. Um, where does Chris Wilder go at the moment with this? Because uh, he's come back in; it's just not happening. No, we, we've seen improvements in certain performances. Um, recruitment at the beginning of the season has not really done him any favours. No. Then we played Brighton, obviously Mason all game, it's GBH, we went first few minutes at game, so we got spanked there. And today was an improvement. Um, we, I don't think we played particularly badly, but I don't, like uh, like you just said, there, there weren't much quality on the pitch from either side. Uh, but when the quality did show, I think Wolves took advantage of it where we just didn't have a shooting boot. So we had chances, but we, we couldn't get in the back of the net. So I think what Chris Wilder's got to do is just keep plugging away at what he's doing and just hope for the best, really. Yeah, I mean, it's a sort of the, the way I remember when you... You first returns uh, to the top flight, really. There was a side that, for all of the surprises they had and, and, and the victories that they got, what they really had as well was, was, uh, was a hard ethic, knowing that even if we haven't got all the quality here, we're not going to make stupid mistakes. And that doesn't seem to be the same this time around. Uh, exactly. I think we we had a, a set lineup, a set spine of the team that had been with us since League One, really. Yeah. Um, and we built that ethos, that team spirit. Everybody knew to a man what their job was. Um, we had Dean Henderson in goal, brilliant goalkeeper. Jack O'Connor was a key part. And the season after that, we lost both of them. Uh, and obviously, we know what happened that season. We got trounced every week, a bit like we are doing at this point. We've never really replaced that spine of the team. I think Chris Wilder, since he's coming, has, has put a bit of that togetherness, mm -hmm. uh, a bit more of a better team spirit than what was there before. But when you're a championship side that's lost the best players at the beginning of the season before a Premier League season, there's not a lot many mm -hmm. people can do. And a lot of people say, no, you're getting spanked every week. It, it's difficult. You, you have one games where you look better. Today we look better. We only lost 1-0. Yeah. But then you obviously you have your, your other games where we concede five at home and it's... It's all by hook or by crook. It's just not happening. Yeah, no. And what, one more on that as well. I mean, sadly, one of the two of the, the headlines will be because people think it'll be good to, to highlight this. But um, I'm going to actually mention it. But a couple of your players having a little go at each other. But that was, you know, that was frustration more than anything, wasn't it? I believe so. We saw a thing come up on the VAR saying violent conduct. We're like, what's happened here? We found out it's uh, Vinnie Souza and Jack Robinson yeah. arguing, I think. Yeah. But it, it sounds daft. That shows to me at least the care. Which... Exactly. <laughs> and I think all of us as fans think like that. You know, if, you've, if you're yeah. having to have a, a, a go at another player for not doing what he should be doing and properly has done in training during the week or whatever, then, yeah. you know, I, I don't mind that. Do you? No, not at all. I'd rather them have a go at each other, show some passion, show some fight, show that they, are, they do still care. They do still want to pull off the miracle of all miracles, as unlikely as it may be. If they were just throwing arms around in handbags and not wanting anything to do with anything, I'd be more concerned. Yeah. But back to Wolves now, Dan. Uh, I know that with uh, a lot of the sides above you, of course, and some of those below who think that uh, it's just a case about spending and the entitlement, entitlement of being um, in that top uh, a little bit of a club in the Premier League, I I'm delighted that Gary O'Neill is showing that it's not just about having to bring in um, an extreme expense players and a management team just because everyone says they're the people that you need. No, he's um, he's serving out uh, plates of humble pie every week at the moment. Gary O'Neill, he's, he's, he's done an outstanding job this season. Like you said, uh, lack of budget, not just in the summer window, in the January transfer window. He, he wasn't backed by... 
the club is is really doing wonders with the players that he's got. He disposes obviously Wangi Chan's our top goal scorer at the moment. Um, Matthias Cunha, I think he only finished last season with maybe one or two goals. Um, he's been massive for us this season and a big miss for us at the moment. Um, it, it'd be interesting to see what Gary O'Neill can do in the summer with a bit of actual financial backing. You'd likely to think that Pedro Neto is going to be sold for for a big value in the summer. Hopefully, he gets uh, a strong percentage of that budget if he does go. Yeah, I mean that's always the worry, though, isn't it, for you? But what 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 he has done already here now is that you know that you're going to be there next season. Let's say, I mean, mathematically, I'd, I'd say we're, we're pretty much safe now on 38 points. Um, but you know, we're we're points off seventh now. It's we've got nothing to lose. We're already overachieving this season from what the you know the uh, the stance was going into the first game of the season after uh, Lopetegui left. Um, we've got Brian in the FA Cup on Wednesday. Um, if we get yeah. past that, you're in the quarterfinal, and then who, who knows where this season ends? Yeah, I was just going to actually mention um, that before I come back to uh, Johnny Dan, that you, you you've got Brighton at home, and in the and the position you're now in, you can really give this FA Cup a, a, a go. Quarterfinals next, if you should get through, and then anything can happen. Yeah, exactly. I think Gary O'Neill's mentioned it in in press conferences recently that. Uh, the club really want to make a go at the FA Cup this season. Obviously, we got to the FA Cup semi-final a handful of years ago where we had a really uh, brutal ending, losing to Watford the way that we did. So hopefully we can get back there again, hopefully go one better. What does it feel, though, back at Sheffield United? Is there uh, already an inevitability about what's going on, do you think? Or have, uh, is there still things that you think, Johnny, that this side can do? It's a strange one because I'm... Um half really pessimistic like a lot of our fan base you kind of think each week ah it's game over now we're just playing for pride but then i think like every other football fan that's been there up and down the country every year is that romantic side well there's no art next to his name yet who knows who knows what could happen but i think the more reality sets in arsenal scoring for fun and we've got them next you look at the fixtures we've got coming up and the realism of he says we're down we're just playing for pride goal difference and see what we can come up with but you never know. You look at you look at when we did it once before under Bassett when we're having Christmas parties every week. And there's always that romantic side of things. We can stay up. But I think the more and more we don't play well in games and come away yeah. with points, that's where the struggle comes. Because today we played well, but again, come away with nothing. Yeah, I, I mean, just to, to follow that up as well, and it's something that uh, I find very distasteful here at the moment that we're having to deal with in the Premier League with Manchester City over 100 charges and just keep pushing it all down the road as if nothing's happened and uh, that won't come to some sort of judgment for years by the sounds of it, which yeah. is absolutely ridiculous. And yet Forrest are uh, waiting possibly to get another point deduction. Everton, who knows exactly what's going to happen with them there. That could make all the difference to the likes of yourselves, Burnley and Luton Town. I don't think it's fair on any of the clubs down there at the no. moment, do you? It's got to be sorted. It has. Teams need to know where they stand. You need to look at um, instances like when we went down with the whole it's years ago with the Tevez thing. You didn't get sorted until yeah. after the season. And you look at teams that went down last season, the, these teams that have got 10 points looked like Everton, should that not have happened last season? So the other teams will be aggrieved. I understand with the Man City, there's so many charges that it's going to take a long time to prepare a case. But when it's one or two charges, the earlier you sort it, the more teams know where they stand. Everton got 10 points took off them and they're still doing well. Yeah. Now, it, a lot of people will see it's unfair to get another 10 points off. But if you broke the rules, you broke the rules. That, that's my stance on it. Yeah. It's just it's a it's a false hope for us because we're they would maybe just maybe we can sneak it if that happens. Yeah, I, mean, um, but I, I, I don't want to have to rely on it. No, I also think that it, it, it it's a real mess uh, when it comes to all of this. Dan is because you may well have played against. Uh, I, I, I don't. I should know perhaps, but I don't know the results that you've had against um, uh, one or two of these sides like Forest and uh, Everton. If they were to lose ten points, that you'd already lost points to them. You know, the whole thing no. is a mess, isn't it? We've, we've, we've done the double over Everton this season. Um, we've, we drew uh, against Forest at Molyneux. We've got uh, Forest away in April. OK. It's, it's frustrating. I'm really concerned what the Premier League are going to do with these 115 charges because my fear is it's going to get brushed under the carpet because if they do punish Man City, to Man City um, push for a, a European Super League? Well... You know what, if there are, the only thing I would say on that, if there are clubs that feel, and there's two or three of them or four of them possibly, if they feel the Super League is for them, um, you know, they're going to go. There's nothing we can do about that. I mean, the whole situation is absolutely ridiculous. But but right now, 
I think what can be done is uh, it's just, it can be sorted. It's just we're just hearing about things week in, week out now about top four, five, six favoured clubs that seem to, to be um, allowed to get away with all sorts of different things and uh, not to finish. I mean, you know, the, the, the Chelsea situation is, is now, I mean, Abramovich is still, is still not paid that money that he's got locked away. Um, there are then other things that uh, have happened with some of these other clubs as well. The whole thing just really is skewed because nobody seems um, able to look outside this top six sides. They're more marketable. That's where a lot of the income for the Premier League comes from is people watching them from abroad. Yeah. Whereas, no disrespect to Forest, Champions League, Winners, European Cup, whatever you want to call it, Team of Great History, Everton, famous old club, they don't quite have that revenue brought into the Premier League that your Chelsea's, your Man City's, your Man U's do. And that people can say all they want that that has nothing to do with it. Of course it does. Premier League don't want to start losing revenue money by docking these club points and making fast work of it. Also, like like I said, with the threat of the Super League, etc. There's a business side to it. And as much as we don't like to see that dark side of football, it's there and it's not going anywhere for the foreseeable. It is, though. But, I mean, both of you must be like me when, uh, you know, I, I heard that Jim... Well, that interview, good interview, actually, with Dan Ryan. But, you know, Jim Radcliffe sitting down and saying... We're going to make Old Trafford this new stadium of the, the, the North, but we want the taxpayer, basically, the governmental help. I mean, I've never heard so much rubbish in all my life. Have you? Absolute nonsense. Yeah. Absolute waffle. They should just regenerate Old Trafford as it is and just stick to what they're doing. Taxpayers shouldn't be building anything like that for anybody, anybody around Premier League clubs, especially with the money they've got. Dan? Yeah, I just think it's false. Call it. FFP, since he came in, has just helped the... Um... The bigger sides take a bit more of the the pie, and you, you know, giving them more resources than the average club to be able to compete with them. It's it's farcical. I don't think we're alone, are we? I've I've sort of, I mean, look, my side is Cambridge United, and we're down in in League One, so we have our own uh, things to think about. But I but I speak to for a lot of fans week in week out on this show as well. What we want certain things for all of us, including for our own clubs, is that that there are rules that everybody knows if they break them, they get punished and swiftly, and if they don't, they don't. But not sort of a two-tier system. I think anything where it comes to financial uh, market, obviously accountants will always find a loophole uh, uh, their way around these sort of things until it's black and white and you, you, can't, um, you can't fool it, then we're, we're stuck, I think. Yeah, we are. Well, look, good luck for you guys in the FA Cup. And, uh, you know, we've all followed Sheffield United because, uh, you know, a side that's um, doing what it can. And I uh, wish you all the best. And I'm sure we're all going to speak again uh, soon, though. So thanks for uh, joining us tonight on the show. So there we are. Wolves against Sheffield United. Great points there from Dan Hughes and from Johnny Gascorn as well. And um, when it comes to Monday night football tomorrow night, it's FA Cup fifth round. Such a big game. It's a side that we've followed a lot of. Oliver Ash, co-owner of Maidstone United, will be joining us. And so too Ross Cooper, Sky Blues extra podcaster. Big game in the Midlands, in the East Midlands, uh, it is. Or uh, Coventry City against Maidstone. Uh, it's tomorrow night. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking it, wet. Yes. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, but it said nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. 
Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. And they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> there are no banners calling for and the re release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no banners, mass. Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march where we no, can't say them on the mass. Sorry, no, I'm yeah. sorry. I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you no, can't. Good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth is going on in the House of Commons? I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. Richard Soon actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised You're by a special counsel. Right. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> My your mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Very good evening to you. If you're joining us tonight uh, here on the Sunday Night Club, uh, it's always good to have you with us. Uh, we've got plenty of football to come in this first hour. We're looking at a different parts of the refereeing story throughout the second hour uh, tonight as well. That, but that will become part of our Wednesday night Back of the Stand podcast. And we also have a Monday night, uh, a Monday, I should say, um, podcast on what's happened tonight as well, all the best bits from it. So uh, two things not to be missed during the week and you can get it on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts uh, from to download that and enjoy it at your own leisure. And in the last hour, we've got Six Nations uh, rugby to talk about. We've got the cricket uh, to come as well, which is very important. Um, not going England's way in this uh, fourth uh, test again, is it, at the moment? But uh, all of that still to come. Just finally, uh, in our football in this first hour, a big FA Cup night tomorrow night. Coventry City up against Maidstone United. Really big this for both sides, actually. Coventry City um, having a really good time, particularly at home this season. Maidstone United, well, it's just uh, one of those great dreams. And getting this far is incredible, really. A win for either of these sides... And it's a quarter-final place, which would then mean they're only one step from a Wembley position in a semi-final. Let's speak then to Ross Cooper, Sky Blues Extra Podcast, and to the co-owner of Maidstone United, Oliver Ash. Uh, Oliver, I will come to you first, uh, if you'll forgive me, Ross. Um, it's great to talk to uh, both of you, but Oliver, uh, you must still be pinching yourself <laughs> this season. Yes, absolutely, Mark. Yeah, it feels like uh, déjà vu. It's the same story. I think you were kind enough to ask me how uh, how things were going before we played Ipswich, and I expected that to be the last game in our FA Cup run, and it's still going on. So, uh, hey, everybody's uh, cock a hoop. Everybody's enjoying it. The town is buzzing, and the fans are having the time of their lives. What's there not to like? No, I, I absolutely like that. And um, this time around, okay, you're away from home, but uh, there'll be a really big travelling support. Yes, uh, similar to the support we had in um, for the Ipswich tie, even though it's a Monday night uh, in Coventry, it's not an easy trip, but the fans are relishing the opportunity, which doesn't come around very often, to play in this round of the FA Cup against a team of the calibre of Coventry City. So there's a great effort to be made. I think there'll probably be a lot of sickies <laughs> tomorrow uh, and uh, 5,000 uh, party supporters will be making their way up uh, towards Coventry. And uh, yeah. so there should be a 
a good atmosphere as there was uh, when we played Ipswich. Well, I'll tell you what, Oliver, it's a terrific ground, Ross Cooper, isn't it? I've actually been there once this season for one of your um, your league matches, uh, not because I support Sunderland, but the rest of my family do, and I'd got my uh, nephew over from New Zealand to watch his first game live uh, with Sunderland, and it was at Coventry uh, City, and uh, what the, the ground's terrific. The atmosphere there is fantastic. And you're really a club going places, whatever happens. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I think the atmosphere and the stadium has sort of transformed over the last sort of five, six years. Obviously, only a few years ago, we weren't even playing in Coventry. So it's massively changed the change of ownership, the branding. It, it feels like home for the first time, really. And I've been going since we obviously moved to the, the Rico, as it was called, in 2005, 2006. And for the first time this season, it really does feel feel like ours and even little things obviously these seats in the dugouts you know it used to just be wasp stuff so it's nice to see and feel like we're at home now well of course it wasn't exactly what you wanted to see this weekend was it for a, um last weekend for a warm-up when you played uh, your last game but you, you, you you're you're doing really well at home in the league aren't you yes yeah, only two defeats the less said about friday night the the better that was uh we'll forget about that one but uh the beauty with football is obviously we've got uh, obviously a game coming tomorrow night. So, yeah, the home form has been really, really impressive. And that's been mainly while we're in the playoff mix in the championship this season. So it's a difficult one, this, isn't it? Because playoffs are really important for the long term future. But the opportunity for Coventry City to go a long way. And, you know, Oliver will also uh, say this, you know, you're expected um, to be favourites for this game. And then, uh, then who knows what may well happen. Many changes going to be made for this match do you think i don't think so i think the manager mark robbins has been pretty clear that it you're not you know all respect to maidstone but you're not going to get a better opportunity to try and get to a quarter final you know with the other teams in the draw so i don't think he wants to take any chances i think he'll want to give some of the players a chance to respond to the disaster on friday night against preston so i think i think it's gonna be as strong as we can get but we've got a lot of injuries at the moment um so, yeah, I think it'll be as strong to, you know, as, as close to the strongest team that we can put out. Your yeah, Sakamoto was another one that got injured, didn't he, the other night? Yes, it looks pretty... Well, we're still waiting for official um, correspondence from the club about that, but it looks like it's something pretty serious. So, yeah, Which is a shame. What about the, the keeping situation? Well, but, yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> that's asked my Robbins that. He, he, I don't know who he'll choose tomorrow. I think he might... He might toss a coin before kickoff, and and then you know heads is Wilson and Collins is Taylor. So I don't know. To be honest, he he, he said that, that we haven't got a number one. He's just got two goalkeepers who are fighting for a place. So we'll yeah. have to wait. So that's true. So Brad Collins perhaps doesn't get back into the side then. Well, I think he might because I think he's playing the sort of backup goalkeeper in the cups, and obviously he sort of was dropped last the last two league games. So maybe Robbins will stick with that sort of theory and and put our number two as at the moment in the in for the cup. Mm. Um, let's come back to you, Oliver, if we may, and uh, just talk a little bit about the things that you've noticed this season at the club, those around it, as you mentioned, in the town and everything else. It it, it reminds me really as to why we, some of us, you know, it's, we, we support where we're born, a lot of us, or those those areas that we've moved to when we first really get into this game, is that... There is such an excitement when things do um, begin to happen. And, and you must have seen so much of that in, in different storylines with the club this season. Well, this season, it's all happening in the FA Cup, really. And uh, it's the most extraordinary season since uh, I started um, and we built the stadium. So that's going back to 10 to 15 years because of this run in the FA Cup. And we've had exceptional games and the fans have had wonderful moments over in that run and just having the club back in town in itself you know somebody asked me the other day what this must be the most special moment uh, of your time at Maidstone and, and actually I don't think it is because it's so important for us to have, have sort of brought the club back to the town that's mm. the that's the platform upon which you know days like tomorrow and, and runs like this are built otherwise there wouldn't be a club so that's mm. probably the the most important thing but what makes this special, I think, is the impact it's had on the town. And I don't live in Maidstone, so I see this uh, second hand. But uh, my son's actually working in Maidstone at the moment uh, and, and training with the team. And he says that there's an incredible buzz around the town. And then suddenly mm. 
to have this town which isn't always the most favoured place. It's had its difficulties to be on the map like this and to have uh, you know, the, the world take notice, even if it's just for a few days. It's, mm. uh, it's giving everybody in the town a real lift. Maybe there's a parallel in a way, in a small way, to what London went through when the Olympic Games were in London. You know, it just sort of it buzzed everybody for a while. And I think that's the main impact. We see everything in the town yeah, buzzing. I, do, you think as well, do you think as well, I mean, I think one of the things, so, I mean, I look at Cambridge United at the moment, we're in League One. But more importantly than that, uh, Paul Berry, who's our forward-thinking owner, uh, was able, uh, with the help of supporters trust and all sorts of other things, to buy back so that the, the, the ground itself that we've played at for many decades now is safe again and hasn't. We've had this hanging over us for many years. And I know that he's going to redevelop, but just in a, in a quiet way to start with a, a bits and pieces within that ground. But again, probably like you as an owner, uh, the thinking the same way, he realises from that now that that was an absolute major thing that he needed to make sure that he was probably, like anybody else, able financially to keep going with the club. Yeah. Well, every club is different, as you know, and, and our story is different from that. And uh, uh, we we have a club which is uh, one of the rare clubs to be already sustainable and it's, it's, mm. it's profitable sort of year by year. So the, the club is on a sound footing anyway. And the challenge we've got really is that um, the, the, the inflation on building costs is such that to continue to expand the stadium, which would probably be comfortable, we could add seats uh, on, on big match days, we are short of seats. It's so expensive now that even this cup run, the surplus funds won't really make a dent in the cost of building. So while this this all supports the club very very nicely and it puts us in a much stronger position, mm. um, it's not going to be so life changing. And we already own the stadium; we've already invested in a very good business model. As you know, we've got the artificial pitch, which brings in a huge amount of direct and indirect mm. revenue. So that's not it's not quite the same as perhaps in the Cambridge situation. No, no. It is extremely good for us. Yeah, and just one other thing on that. I mean, I um, my local. Uh curry house in stamford which is a lovely town in the north of uh, in, in the south of lingardshire north cambridge and we live nearby there and habib uh, sponsors stamford town who are having a great season a, a few leagues uh, down as well and 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 what i'm i hear from a lot of different people is that you know a lot of people have turned back to focus on the clubs within the area they live because prohibitively some of them for traveling and, and bigger clubs are you know, families of four and five can't always afford to spend that, but they're finding by just joining the club uh, to watch it that they they come from. They they really find a different feel as a supporter. Yes, there's definitely uh, that side of things. We'll, we'll probably see some sort of positive impact, at least temporarily, after this cup run on attendances. Whether it lingers is a different matter. There's a lot of you know the five thousand that travel to. Coventry tomorrow and the travel to Ipswich there's an awful lot of those fans who don't come regularly to our matches so we're hoping certainly to pick up uh, a number of fans we try and make the match experience as comfortable as possible it's not always easy mm. um, so hopefully we will and this, comp this competition you see the, the, the difficulty is that some of the clubs who are in higher divisions than ourselves the price differential from, from the National League or the National League South isn't that great and because the income from other sources, for example, at the top level, it's uh, obviously TV money, mm -hmm. is so great, they can reduce their prices if they want. So there's not always that uh, competitive advantage. So, look, it's as I keep saying, it's always a real struggle to operate at our level, make a profit and avoid getting into difficulties. And even this last week, we've seen two clubs, Rochdale and, yeah. and Torquay, announce more difficulties every week. Clubs who don't operate in a, in a sensible, business-like way get into difficulties, and that you know, among apart from all the euphoria of, of this wonderful cup run that we've been having, that's really what keeps uh, us boring business people going is to try to preserve this club for generations of fans to come. It's as simple as that, and by, by being prudent, that's what we'll achieve. Yeah. Well, we're talking actually about. Uh... Torquay United after nine o'clock on the show tonight. We thought we we're trying to revisit so many of the the clubs that are that are having problems and the fans that are doing the best that they can. And of course, I know Coventry City well. Uh, my my uh, in-laws and my wife um, came from Kenilworth, and uh, so they you know they followed Villa and Coventry, uh, various parts of the family for 
forever. And of course, Coventry City have had their their terrible moments as well in all of this, haven't they, financially? Well, that's all I tend to know, really. When uh, when my dad got me to be a Coventry City supporter, obviously we, we won the FA Cup in 1987. Unfortunately, I wasn't around then. So all <laughs> I've known, apart from the last few years, has been sort of turmoil, ground shares, you know, administ- back-to-back administrations. So we've had, we've been in the mire, you know, and it's it has been really, really tough going down to League Two, which sort of been at the bottom of the league and. Yeah, I mean, the work back, the, the job that Mark Robbins has done against, you know, the backdrop of, you know, bottom three budgets for a lot of the times, you know, relative to other clubs. And obviously now it finally feels like he's, you know, uh, got a decent hand to work with, you know, and the fans are sort of rejuvenated because, you know, those sort of ground shares just cause a lot of toxicity amongst yeah. the city. It was a, it was a not a nice place to go, but now it's completely different. Well, I, I couldn't, I mean, the atmosphere was... Terrific. When you go to a club that you're a fan of neither side and everything, and I was able as well because it wasn't able to get a really decent seat in the Coventry City end um, behind the goal. I mean, the the vantage point at any part of that ground is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, if you were behind the goal, you might have been sat a row behind me, to be fair. That's where I was. Yeah, well, I could was... easily have been. I kept my head down, really. I mean, it was uh, <laughs> it was uh, it was just a good game to watch. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think, yeah, it's all those little things. I mean, yeah, the, the stadium, for a lot of the time when we moved there, initially, it's sort of, obviously, I think fans missed Highfield Road and the old stadium and all the sort of nostalgia that came with that. But over the last two seasons or so, the match day experience, the, the extra bars, there's a brewery nearby and all sorts that suddenly now, I think people are not missing Highfield Road. And actually, this is what we want to enjoy. And they've put a lot of effort into making it feel as good as possible and hopefully the Maidstone fans tomorrow will, you know, will, will witness it and it, you know, I think they're anticipating a crowd of at least 26,000. So yeah, it should be a great, uh, great occasion. Yeah, I'm glad that you've mentioned there some of the, um, the areas sort of uh, firms putting money in because that, that is important, but the club has got to show that it doesn't want to waste it either. Well, exactly, exactly. And I think, the, I think what the club and the new owner, Doug King, since he's come in is seeing that actually if you, if the club put effort into things, then actually the fans buy into that and then they reciprocate it, you know, and even just from the retail side of the new club shops opened and the retail lines have sort of expanded probably tenfold compared to what they were. And actually fans will then spend the money, put the hand in the pocket because they, they see the club are trying to do things, you know, and the regeneration around the ground and inside the concourse, little things that hadn't been touched probably since the stadium opened. You go now and go, oh, it feels quite, you know, uh, fresh and new. So it's so it's great. No, I mean, Oliver, we've, we've had a, a little bit of that at Cambridge United recently. I mean, we've got uh, principal uh, sponsors. One of them is a local craft beer brewery called Brew Board, who've uh, Im- invited any fans that wanted to go along when they were doing a tasting to name which of best four lagers would you like and would how would you name it as something to do with Cambridge United? And they... You know, it was in a village outside the city and they, they put on transport both ways. Absolutely fantastic and have played a big part in it. And uh, there are others as well now that um, are getting involved. And, and I think that that's, that's important as well, don't you? That the responsibility of the community to understand what the football club is trying to do at the same time. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and particularly at this time, everybody wakes up when a little club like ours does things which are unexpected and and uh, has the opportunity to to, to visit the uh, the the ex Rico as as I still call it. Uh, it does, you know, light the fire in our sponsors and business partners uh, hmm. camps as well, and they're all right behind us and suggesting things and offering us extra incentives. So we, you know, we've got a good group of of, right. of su- business supporters at our level, and they're right behind us uh, all the way. Now, I, I've got to ask you this, uh, Oliver. Are you a good watcher? No, I'm a terrible watcher, Mark. I'm a really terrible watcher. Um, I have to try and control myself. It's almost like doctor's orders because I, I can. I, it's easy to make yourself ill when you're watching a match. It, there's nothing like being involved as a, a sort of capitalistically as an owner or, <laughs> or director of the, of the game. It's nothing like. I mean, I'm a West Ham fan. Always have been, and no match, no matter how tense in the past, when I've seen my club play mirrors anything like what I suffer watching Maidstone United. It's just totally different. And I have to try and keep calm. And if, if 
as will probably happen, we'll 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 lose and we'll be four nil down at half time. It almost be more relaxing yeah. that somehow we, we manage to compete and we're either level or only one goal yeah. down game moves to its conclusion. That would be terribly stressful. So yeah. uh, it's a oh, double edged Oh well, you know we we better be on standby then with the St John's when uh, you go, uh, if you go one up early. Yeah, I have one of my sons there looking after me. I'll be, I'll be all right. <laughs> oh, look, absolutely right. brilliant. Look, Oliver, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's a fantastic journey. I hope the journey continues for you, uh, but also for you, Ross. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, it, it's uh, it's been a great FA Cup for us on the Sunday Night Club. It's the first time we've been able to do this and to enjoy it and be part of uh, following these clubs right the way through. We will continue to do it as it goes and keep you right up to date next weekend, whether it's Coventry City we're talking to or whether it is Maidstone United. This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking it, wet. Yes. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia. This is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, but it said nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. And they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent, that's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for the re will release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no banners, mass. Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march where we can't no, say them on the mass. Sorry, no, I'm yeah. sorry. I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You well, can't. Good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth? is going on in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. Richard Soon actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advising you on a special case. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> my your mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. 
How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. The illness helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet office. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and Radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a gun. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Well, we're not just back in business, we're back at the stand as well with our podcast. If you've missed uh, parts of the first hour that you perhaps would like to hear again, we have two podcasts for you every week. On Mondays, it's uh, the programme that brings all the highlights uh, of the show. And on Wednesday, our middle hour, we're taking a different topic, if possible, every week to do with sport. This week, it's all to do with refereeing and trying to inspire the next generation and with some of the people... Um, that are very much involved in all of this and have been at the very top of their profession. Delighted to say that Nigel Owens, the, uh, one of the great rugby international referees, joins us later on. Uh, Keith Hackett and Mark Halsey, both with me uh, already uh, for the start of the show. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Sags. I bet you're unhappy losing your manager, aren't you? No. No? No, I'm not, actually, in the end. Oh, I, yeah. I don't... I, ne I never... Uh, well, just to let everybody know we're talking about here, Neil Harris, who um, came for eight games, um, brought in a couple of signings and then got the job he couldn't refuse and went straight back to Millwall, who beat Southampton yesterday. Unbelievably at St Mary's by two yeah. goals to one, while we lost to Peterborough United. Now, as I said to my son-in-law, Matt, last night, uh, he's a Southampton fan. I'm a Cambridge United fan. Neil Harris did us both yesterday. Well, yeah, I'm, I was quite disappointed in Southampton because QPR beat Rotherham, get in there and... Uh, a word about... Gone, a word... Uh, we, uh, we talk... I started the programme uh, yeah. about Stan Bowles because oh. Stan, um, mm. for, for me, was... Well, there was a bit of all of us in Stan. I mean, I've been a gambler. Yeah. I don't bet these yeah. days, but... Um, yeah. You know, there was something that you liked about him that you felt yeah, but... you could have... You could meet him in the street and he'd, he'd just be like you were. No, no, I, I, listen, oh, I'm, I'm I'll tell you a great story. QPR fan. Hang on, I can't have you all talking at once. I'm going to oh, give the oh. QPR, QPR fan the first chance here. Born yes. and bred QPR. My family are from Shepherds Bush, East Acton, and uh, I remember going many, many times down to Loftus Road to watch Stan, and he was an absolute legend. It, it was a privilege for me to go along and watch watch Stan and all and all, all the rest. Um, he was QPR, and like you say, he was... I think he would, have, he would he would walk into any team today, any team, because he just had natural ability and and he should have won more England caps than he got. He was an absolute yeah. legend and a, a joy joy to watch. I loved. I used to go every other week, every all the home games to watch him. Yeah. And uh, it's it's a it's a very very sad day for for QPR. And, yeah. and you know my my condolences go to to Stan and his and his family, friends and family yeah. at this you know, awful time. Yeah. Um, uh, what yeah. about you yeah. then, Keith? Did you, in your later stages of your career, ever come across him in the early stages? Oh yes, <laughs> he was he was a legend uh, and a character. And uh, the story I'll just re regale you of was I was refereeing a cup game at Wolverhampton Wanderers versus QPR. Tommy Doherty was the manager of QPR, and about twenty twenty five minutes into the game. Stan hadn't really appeared. I mean, he, he, he was there, but hadn't usually done his, his tricks. And uh, Doherty came to the side of the pitch, indicating, uh, didn't have boards then, that he was subbing uh, Stan Bowles. Uh, and uh, I, I ran up to him. He was completely ignoring Doherty. And I, I ran up and said, Stan, he's subbing you. And he walked away. I mean, he just completely ignored me. And, and I've got a problem. So uh, Tony Curry was stood at the side of me and I said, Tony, can you get a message to Stan? He, he's, he's being substituted. We need to get the game going. No, you're on your own, is what Curry said. <laughs> so I approached uh, Stan and I, I said to him, Stan, are you getting paid the same 
for 30 minutes as you would for 90. And before I got an answer, he was on his way off. <laughs> and he just ran off. And I'm thinking, was it my coming or had he suddenly decided he, he didn't want to be sent off and just and just ran off? But yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, QPR at that time was, was a had some really terrific players, yeah. and um, and and they were they were a great team to referee because actually on occasions they'd say leave us alone, let yeah. us get on with it, and that's how they play. Yeah, brilliant stuff. I remember that season. I think was it that season they played Man City late on at Loftus Road when they when they yes. came close to winning the title. Yes. No, that, that, yes. uh, what the pre? The, the seventy six would it been seventy six? Yeah, yeah, that's it. We, I, I think mm. we lost it. We lost the weight at Norwich. Yeah, um, and then obviously to a, a disputed uh, offside goal, which was Miles offside. <laughs> and I think then we then and then we uh, we played Leeds at home. Oh, that's and we won. We won two new. It was on the plastic. I think it was on the plastic pitch then, wasn't it? No, oh, yeah. that, that was that was the following season. The plastic pitch, yeah. I think. And then obviously Liverpool went to Wolves. They had to beat Wolves because we beat Leeds. I think it was two 0 at home. And then we, because I was at that game. Yeah. And then we, then uh, Liverpool went to Wolves in midweek, and they had to beat Wolves to uh, to win the title. And we got picked by mm. Liverpool. Yeah. But well, the great, great memories, great right. memories of a great man. And Chris Nichol as well. Did you did you yeah. ever um, yes. officiate with him? Uh, yeah, he, 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 he was a guy who uh, was terrifically uh, efficient in in his role and wasn't an ounce of problems it just it just got on with the game uh, would exchange if there was a, a decision that he might not have agreed with it was all done in the right manner you know done quietly out of the public eye uh, sad when we we lose these players and of mm. course my condolences to both families sure. uh, it's a difficult time well, Keith and Mark, we've got plenty of time in this hour now to uh, talk about refereeing. Uh, refereeing, which has been under a spotlight that uh, I, I, I haven't wanted to see this season, but the officiating and VAR mm. has been at times laughable, at times a nonsense, and at times very, very worrying. But if we can sort of start by by going back to think of what made both of you come into this a uh, great part of our game and both have incredible careers. Keith, what, what was it that you thought, you know what, I'd like to be part of this? Well, I mean, I, I, I was a, a player at a, a grassroots level in Sheffield when we had to go and have a referee's exam uh, because a member of each team in Sheffield was expected to go and learn the laws of the game and then pass them on to your teammates. That's exactly what I did. And I... Uh, for a number of weeks after I passed the exam, I had no intentions of refereeing. And then I got a phone call from the county FA, and before I could actually say no, the phone was put down. And it was it was literally, you're refereeing Sheffield United Juniors versus Hillsborough Boys Club intake school, Cabin Road, still there, that pitch. Oh. And um, oh, I, I borrowed a shirt, I borrowed a whistle. Um, I got no kit whatsoever. <laughs> and and I, I, I ran out onto the pitch and uh, I mean the play was going one way and I was going the other um, and I, I eventually I got into it what what was really nice was that this guy came up to me after after the match and he said I guess you're a, quite an experienced referee the way you've refereed this game you let it go and you allowed the game to flow and I said to him this is my first match and, I, and he looked shell-shocked, but I know what he did. He sent a letter into the county FA, and because on the Tuesday I got a call from the county FA saying, we hope now that you might forget about playing football and, and take up refereeing. And, that, and that's how it all mm. started. And, of course, you were a decent Amazing. decent keeper, Mark, as you like to keep telling us, um, <laughs> before you started I mean, refereeing. Yeah. Now, you were, was it injury or what was it that made made you yeah. decide that you, yeah, you might get a career out of it? His eyesight yeah, was I mean, going, Mark. Mark, his eyesight was going. Well, it was perfect for a referee then. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. said it got worse when I started refereeing. Um, yeah, listen, I, I've played many, many years as, as a, in, in the non-league. I'm starting out as, you know, as a trainee at, at Tottenham and then at uh, 
training at Barnet and Watford. Um, I sort of then drifted into non-league at uh, Hartford Town, St Albans, Cambridge City, um, Welling Garden City. And then sort of at the age of 28, I, I had a couple of serious injuries um, where I spent two to three weeks in hospital with a nasty leg injury, lost a few teeth in an elbow incident, which the referee never saw. Um, and I just fell out of love with the game, really. Um, and it was a good friend of mine who unfortunately is now passed, has asked me, said to me, why don't you, why don't you get involved in refereeing? Because he's, his house backed onto our cricket pitch. And in the summer, I used to I used to stop playing football and then go and play cricket because I love me cricket. Not doing too well in the test, are we, in mm. India? But um, So he said to me, why don't you become a referee? Because I was telling him I was, I was falling out of love with the game. And he said, Mark, why don't you, why don't you take up refereeing? I said, Russell, you've got to be absolutely joking. There is absolutely no way I am becoming a referee. And it was funny that that summer I thought about it and I said to me, if I can, because you, you have to do an eight week course. Yeah. You have to in, mm. in, in those days. Um, I said, mm. if I can take the laws of the game test without doing this course, then I'll think about it. So I, I, they allowed me to take the exam. I passed the exam and I never looked back. I, you know, I remember my first mm. ever game uh, for the Welling Hatfield Sunday League. It was uh, Arctic Lights v Welling. Um, and all the, all the guys, knew me because I, I played with them players on a Sunday or a lot of them when we played on a, on a Saturday, on a Saturday, our Saturday team. Um, so they knew, they knew what I was like. And my first ever game, no yellow cards, Keith, you know, I had a career of not giving cards out, didn't I, Keith? So, um, but yes. I, I, re I really, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. And the lads, you know, seemed to enjoy it as well. Uh, I just think that, uh, playing the game, playing the game helps you. It's not always about the laws mm. of the game. It's about knowing the game of football. And I think there's, mm. you know, it's, we're few and far between that have actually played at a good, good standard, like myself and Keith, um, that, mm. that went on to referee, and, and, and we mm. weren't that bad. At it. I know some people will, will curse us and say we were one of the worst, we were the worst referees going, but on the whole, I think we were, you know, we were liked by the fans, and and, and I, I know certainly I got on well with. Them players and, and the managers because I, I remember Jose Romino, Mourinho coming up to me after the game saying you're the 23rd player on the field of play and that that, that sort of meant a lot because obviously I'm, I'm, I do know the game and as well as the laws of the game. And and for you mm. Keith just finally in this point before we Steve uh, Chittenden joins us and then we're also going to talk obviously with Nigel Owens a little later on in this hour. Um, do, do you have a feeling that uh, you know with players who've got injured and or others have, that have found that they're not going to be good enough for the professional game but could st still have the athleticism have a bit of knowledge of the game should uh, are they coming forward in enough numbers or uh, uh, should refereeing be do even more at the moment to encourage these guys and women of course i think i i really think mark that there's a there's a sort of barrier of entry for ex-professional referees because you know, ex-professional -play players, should I say. Because what they expect a professional player is to go back and referee in the local parks. For, for like, you know, when you when you look at Mark's career, my, my own, I, I, I was 12 years at grassroots level before I got anywhere near the professional game. That's a long apprenticeship. And and I, I've talked in the past with the FA and said, look, what, what you should do is credit uh, someone who's been in an academy or being a, a journeyman pro player and work on the basis that you run a soccer school, uh, just like, you know, uh, the, the, the programs we see on television where they take someone and they learn them how to cook or learn them how to sing or whatever, improve them, then that's what I think they should do with, with some academy players and some ex-pros, you know. They, they're not earning... 30 grand a week like the championship so if you if you're down and you're a semi-pro you th th there ought to be a route in for those people because uh, you know it's amazing how when i look back those uh, referees that i know that played the game george mckay mick Lodi from sheffield they played for sheffield wednesday uh mick Lowe was a goalkeeper at sheffield wednesday and he was a he was a good referee. McCabe was an international referee. Bob Matheson at at Bolton Wanderers he he played at, at Bolton Wanderers, became a, a referee, and soon got onto the professional list. So I think there are sufficient examples within the game 
that say having knowledge and played the game, you can become good referees yeah. like cricket umpires become good umpires. I, I, couldn't, right. I couldn't agree. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Sex, Just finally, I mean, Mark, on this. In there, yeah, I, I want you to in. come in here, but I want you also then very quickly before you say your point finally for this part to ask you, you know, should there be, say, I don't know, 20 spots for or 10 spots every season available only for ex-professionals who fancy having a go? Yeah, listen, by the way, myself, well, Mark, Steve, listen, yeah. myself and Steve Chin have come through the South County FA. Yeah. So um, yeah. we know each other very yeah. well. But going on to what you're saying, Sags, is that if we look at professional cricketers, yeah. when they finish their career, they go into umpiring, OK? Yeah. Where do they, a lot of them go into umpiring, where do they start? Where do they do their training, their education? In the second 11 cricket, Yeah. OK? So we, as Keith <laughs> rightly said, we have, we have a lot of um, professionals at League One, League Two, National League level that, you know, come to, yeah. they retire early. They don't earn the money that they do in a championship and, and the Premier League. So they're not going to be out. They need to, they need other jobs when they finish football. So why do we not see if we can fast track them, make, you know, laws of the game and they start their, their careers in the National League? So they don't have to start yeah. right at the bottom. Yeah. So we, they start in the National League. Some of them may not be good referees. Don't mean to say an ex-player will become a good referee, because no. that's not the case. All of them are not going to become good referees, but we may get three, four, or five, six of them, which yeah. is what we need. So exactly. I, I believe that we yeah. should fast-track some of these ex-pros when they start at the National League level. OK, Mark and uh, Keith, uh, just for the moment, uh, we'll be joined by Steve Chitterton as well next uh, when we look at uh, refereeing standards. I want to start looking at refereeing standards next here on Talk TV. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on at the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument. We tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Yes. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? <laughs> What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for and the re will release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no banners, Hamas. Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march when we can't say them on Sorry, no, I, yeah. sorry, I've, got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you no, can't. Good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth 
is going on in the House of Commons? I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. All right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. If Rishi Sunak actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special guy. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. What? Oh. what? <laughs> My your mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Very good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Well, we're uh, talking refereeing uh, on uh, this, the uh, Talk TV Sunday Nightclub. Also very much part of our podcast this Wednesday, Back of the Stand, we're focusing in on our referee talk of an hour over this hour and uh, we'll bring you all the highlights for that you'll be able to download that whichever platform you use on Wednesday uh, as always uh, Keith Hackett and uh, Mark Halsey are both with me and delighted to say that another referee and a man now who is uh, making a business with uh, quite rightly with uh, grassroots referees which is uh, all different aspects to uh, the game uh, to help for those going forward. Steve Chitterton, who uh, joins us right now. Steve, very good evening to you. Thank you. Hi, Mark. Oh, it's good to have you with us. I mean, uh, you've got to put up with these other two. I mean, already Halsey is, is laughing for some reason. I'd say, you what, he, he's changed a bit with age. Are you all right, mate? <laughs> yeah. I'm good. Are you well? Yeah, all good, mate. All good. Um, we, came, we, came, we came through the RSFA together, me and Chits. Yeah. Um, uh, well, the, the first thing I'm going to ask you about, Steve, here, and the others will no doubt uh, join in on this in a moment. I mean, you had it you know, with great experience of, of a refereeing, and now you're doing more to it as well with all sorts of part from referee kits to whatever and, mm. and continuing um, to be part of this. And uh, what one of the big things for all of us is that it's getting the right referees now uh, to come into the game and to make sure that we are going to be able to cope with everything that the football authorities throw at referees these days. Yeah, I think I think the important thing um, when they're coming in at the bottom end is to is to remember that they're all they often learn from are the referees at the top level, and uh, Mark will will know this. Um, by the way, Mark waiting for this green. I'm still active, still refereeing grassroots locally, still on the Hearts Ad League, which is a great league in St Albans and an area. But I, the the thing right. that worries me is the discipline. The discipline in grassroots football is, is on a massive decline. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I have to say, a lot of that, I think, comes from what everybody sees at the top level. Um, I've always said that Saturday's fans become Sunday's managers, parents standing on the touchline. We're involved with a with a, a brilliant Facebook um, uh, called Grassroots uh, Referees Discussion Forum. So it's a Facebook. Some of the posts that I see on there from 15, 16 year old referees that have gone to do a game, they've passed through their course, they've gone to do their first one, two, three games, and they get abused. By a parent of an under mm. ten. Yeah. Where's, where's, where's the safeguarding? Where's okay, the safe guys, guarding? guys, I'm not uh, because there's four of us in this discussion now. I'm going to sort of name you before you come back in, and have got a point to uh, say. Us, we're all talking over each other, which is of Thanks. no no news for the to the viewers. Off you go, Sags. You can give me Get a off. red card, but you can't because it, this is my <laughs> show, mate. <laughs> What's that? Off, hey, does that look like good enough one for you at the moment? 
Oh, yeah, I'd accept that, ref. Or should we have one of those and put you in a sim bin oh, for no, five minutes? Put that, that in the bin, sir. Put that in the bin. No, no, just, just, one of ours, Mark. <laughs> just to go one, one back on you, Steve, for that. I mean, this is a really difficult problem, isn't it? All round, where uh, dads and mums and everybody else and, and the, 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 the kids watch all of this and see them getting away with all of this, which is never going to help any of us. No. And, and I mean, for me, one of the worst jobs at the top end of the game now is the fourth official. He's like easy, easy bait. You know, the way the managers are up to the fourth official and, and berating him, and it's, Mark will tell you, Keith, it's a horrible yeah. job, fourth yeah. official. You 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 stood between the benches, and, and that cascades down. And so players think they can act like that. The, the parents standing on the touchline, they think it's right. If a decision goes against their side, they believe it's right to to berate the referee. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter his age. It doesn't matter male or female. They think it's their, their right to be able to berate the referee. So, from what you've said there, Keith, and I'll bring you in, Keith, and then you, Mark, as well on this one. I've been. I was thinking about this before because I was I was at the Peterborough Cambridge United match yesterday, and I wasn't too far uh, away from the fourth official. Would there be a, a possibility, do you think, for players or ex-players or those interested in refereeing that ha don't have the mobility to be a referee or an assistant, that you could still have well, even people like myself or you guys coming back into the game as a fourth official, that your job is, is that job on the sideline? Keith? I think that there's uh, credence in what you say because I, th I think that fourth official often, if he's operating with a young up-and-coming referee, if you get the right fourth official, uh, half-time and full-time, as part of the review of the game and the performance, that could be passed on and be very valuable. And there may be some idea that in that situation, that referee has the same fourth official week in, week out, mm. to build that relationship and, and to build the trust in each other. But at the moment, it's out of control. And, you know, I, I think that ultimately at the end of the day, the fourth official role is, is, is a job that nobody wants mm. uh, because it, it's nothing to do with refereeing. It's actually sorting out two managers. And then we look now, there's a busload of people in each technical area. Yeah. But and, you, you, I don't. You know, I think you're right. Times... I don't. I think you're right there, Keith. In that it isn't a job possibly for the referee or their assistants, but it's the sort of job I would have enjoyed doing. I, w I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have wanted to have been a, a referee or an assistant, but to to stand there, to having trained to know the laws and what they're doing, I would find that that for me, if I was wanting to be that, and there'll be many others, I'm sure. Yeah, you know what? I'll have a bit of this, and I'll I'll do it in the right way, not to make a name for myself or anything like that. But we'll we'll have that. So we've got three men there doing it. You're the fourth member of the team, and away you go, Mark. Yeah, I think listen, it's a it's a good idea. I think if you in the if you look at the UEFA competitions in the Champions League and the Europa League, they have a they have a delegate there that that takes care of the substitutes mm. and, and 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 they get the board ready. They they fill in all the cards for the fourth official he has nothing to do with that and then they then they go and put the ball up the fourth official so yeah i think that the, the fourth official's got to concentrate on what's going on in the field of play you can't keep looking around look, looking down filling in the car because you might miss something that's on the field of play or miss something that's going on in the technical area but i think it's down to the, the, the fourth official and his personality about about managing that that technical area yeah, you've got to you've got to engage with the managers you've got to be you've got to have a smile on your face with them you've got to it's about managing the game, managing the players, and managing the technical area. And yeah. it's how you how you talk to those players and and the, and the tech in the technical area. It and makes a massive difference. Yeah. If, if you if you can't if you can't if you can't engage them and humour them and talk with them, then then you're going to lose them. <laughs> it's so about it's... getting them you're getting them on your side and and keeping them in place. And if you if if you if you are polite with them and and you you have a smile and a, a little joke with them, they will respond to you. You will, you, they will then respect you and then they will behave themselves. I never, ever 
had a problem in, in the technical area with, with managers. Well, let's, Never. Let, look, Steve, I'll come back to you here, if I may. So with what you're <laughs> saying there, and, and we all know about this, you know, this behaviour from parents mm. and everything, what is the way forward for that? Is it a twofold that referees um, have the ability to um, not only send you know, managers and there are a number of others on the bench there to the stands, but that they're then punished properly for that with not draconian punishment, but much more punishment than they get at the moment, which causes a problem with them running their football teams. And therefore, they would see more of that lower down and, and, and a similar sort of thing. Or else... You know, where you're starting as a referee, you might be walking and getting into your car or onto your bike as a young man or woman thinking, I don't want to do this and I haven't even got anywhere yet. Exactly. So that was my point that, that these young referees, you know, thousands of referees pass through the course that the county FAs run each year. But they go to their local park. I'm not saying it's every single one of them, but, you know, if you're a 15 year old boy girl and you get abused at a game you're going to go home and think I'm not sure if I want to carry on doing this um mm. when you go back to our, 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 I'm not sure what the solution is by the way but mm. I know the FA are talking more about bringing in more volunteers at grassroots level that do the referees course which I think would be an excellent idea I think each team at each club should maybe have two three four referees within the team parents that, that sit the referees course yeah. And then at least put somebody there who might offer a bit of support because these young referees might get dropped off at a, at a club and they might do three or four games on a Sunday. So they might get left there at 15. They might be on their own. And I just think if you've got somebody within a club or within a team, they did run a mentor scheme, the club had to put forward a club delegate. But I think mm, if you had encouraged volunteers from, from the team, to mm. sit the referee's course and be identified as a referee, that could help the situation. I think it will give support to the young referee. One of the other problems that, uh, that I've foreseen this, Keith, as, as well as being, it is different these days. People, everybody's got to keep with the times and there are, there are different things that cause complex problems with this. I, my late father was a PE teacher. He was a football referee. Um, and he refereed at all stages at school level and uh, county games and uh, and other things as well. And um, but he he took no nonsense. But but he but he had the backing of being a credible teacher at a school that played decent football. Now yeah. Um, yeah. you know that that sort of thing has has turned round now, Keith. In that you know it's it's not so much in schools playing football it's these clubs outside schools who don't have that extra discipline available to them yeah i th i you know mark the, the more i think about this and i'm going to say something i think is controversial i i think that the fa are bringing in kids at too young an age to actually referee mm -hmm. I, I i think that you need to be have a degree of maturity so if, if they are going to continue bringing referees in at 14, 15 years old, then those referees have got to officiate within, an, if you like, a football academy. They've got to be protected, you know. And, and you know, I mean, I mean there, were, there was a guy, uh, Jeff, who, who ran A&H a &H International. We, we knew him as a, as a referee since past. And he used, he used to have an academy at Charlton Athletic, and he used to bring these young referees in, but they were protected. There were no parents. They weren't allowed in, into the academy. And so I think there needs to be a review as to how you can actually better, uh, if you like, educate the individual and protect that individual. Because there's no point in someone sitting a course for 150 quid cost me nothing, by the way, mm -hmm. now costs them £150. They've then got to go to Steve and they get a special deal on the kit, which is fantastic. And then they referee about three games and pack in. You know, my own club brought six... We paid for six young, young people to go through the course. Only two of those are now continuing to referee, mm -hmm. even though they're in a reasonably protected environment. As soon as they hit 
uh, are hit with criticism, which is quite cutting. You know, these are these are parents that can be really uh, aggressive in their approach, and and no wonder these kids suddenly go, "I'm not having that," and walk away, which is a pity because sometimes we lose them to the game as a whole. Mm. I can look, you make some great points there, Keith. Um, we're going to be staying on. Steve, it's been great to have you. Just a final thought from you, if I may, in this part of the show as well. Um, as uh, Keith was saying there, you know, you're very much part now business-wise and others within uh, refereeing that, that you did yourself so well at as well, is that, um, you know, there are enough people to want to take this forward, but the parents have got to want to understand. They've got to understand. Sorry, it's the old adage. No referees, no game. And I see it now come away from the younger referees. I see it happening more in grassroots football where I think it will ultimately come to a point where where senior referees, by age I mean senior referees, doing grassroots football will say, Do you know what, we're not going to referee that club. We're not going to go and referee mm -hmm. that club because of the way we treat it. So it will it will ultimately may come out the hands of the, the county FA's disciplining. The, the, le the leagues, who I know their hands are tied to take any action until the county FA has taken action. And it may be the referees who say, we, we don't want to referee that club. And that's where I think mm -hmm. it, it will go. Mm -hmm. Steve, you make some mm -hmm. great points. Thank you very much indeed for joining yeah. us uh, tonight. Keith and Mark staying with us. Delighted to say that we're also going to be joined next by Nigel Owens, one of the greatest uh, rugby union referees of all time. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. All <laughs> this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Well. <laughs> the most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically-minded uh, project called WikiLeaks, which said nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? You know? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for and the they will release not of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no Hamas. banners, Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march not, when no, it comes to no, Hamas. No, sorry, no, I'm yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't. Good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth 
is going on in the House of Commons? I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. I, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. If Richard Sunak actually have brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special right. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh, <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> Your <laughs> mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Collins. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Republic of Mike Graham. Ah! Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. Well, delight uh, you're with us tonight on the Sunday Night Club with uh, all of the different uh, chats that we're having tonight. This is uh, on refereeing at the moment uh, in our middle hour where we uh, take a debate and see where it goes uh, for us. And uh, refereeing tonight, delighted to say, as always, Keith Hackett and Mark Halsey. Uh, top football referees from the past are both with me and joined now by one of the greats of uh, Rugby Union who retired in 2020 and Nigel Owens um, uh, joins us as well. Nigel, thank you very much indeed for being uh, part of this uh, today. And, you know, we've talked here a lot about football as opposed to rugby football and the lack of discipline now for young referees starting out. I, wasn't it one of your own school teachers that, that helped you first get into refereeing as a youngster? Yes, um, I, I was. Uh, good evening, everybody. I was I was playing rugby in in school. Um, I was sixteen years of age, and um, I wasn't very good. And uh, we hadn't won a game all season, um, and we had an opportunity to to win the last game of the season. We'd been hammered because we were quite a new school, a Welsh uh, school, so quite a new school. Numbers are low at that time, and the score was twelve all. And uh, my my best friend Wayne Thomas scored a try at the end of the game. My other great mate, Craig Bunnell, was a captain, and I said, look, I, I, the conversion was to come right in front of the post. And I said, look, I, I'll, I'll take the conversion, thinking it's easy in front of the post. We win 14-12. I'll be a hero in school. <laughs> and I took the conversion, and it went uh, closer to the corner flag than it did between the upright. And my sports teacher, John Biden, <coughs> the late John Biden, unfortunately, he said, he said, Nigel, he said, for, for God's sake, will you go and referee or something? And, and, and that's how it all started, just because of that misconversion. Um, but uh, uh, as well, I don't, have you ever, interestingly, ever refereed any football matches, the round ball at all? I have, actually. I did a charity um, football event about or oh, five six months ago okay. uh in a small village not not far raising uh, um uh, money for cancer charities and um i was refing the game and i said to the players they were so well behaved and i said to the players um you don't tell them you behave like this every saturday and they um said one of them the players said to me no we don't he said but uh, you don't referee us on saturday so um, they were very well behaved. It was a, it was a fun tournament, so the pressures of winning were, were not there. But there's a football field right next door to the house where I live here, and so I watch a little bit of football because my godson used to play. He's obviously he's a bit older now, we, um, mm. but he used to play with the juniors and stuff. So I watch a little bit of bit of bit of football mm. on on the local community side here, and I enjoy watching football most much mm. of the day usually rather mm. than watch a whole live game. You know. What about uh, on this this point then? Because football for us with difficulty, we've talked about uh, junior football for youngsters now where referees are getting you know as, as young as 15 and 16 getting abused by mums and dads on the mm -hmm. touch lines was was rugby a different uh view from that because there was more discipline and more respect for the referees at the various different levels as you made your way to the top yeah there, there certainly is a difference i don't think rugby can take the moral high ground because a lot of things that rugby can can do better and need to do better um, and there is abuse in rugby as well, uh, particularly at a sort of junior level, not to the extent that I think that football is, but certainly it is in rugby. So rugby certainly can't say that there's, there's no issues there. And that issues have changed. Um, society has changed, and that, I think, has changed in sport, in all sports as well. What I believe rugby does 
better than football is the abuse is there um but it tends to deal with it so when it does uh, arise itself rugby does tend to deal with it but football doesn't seem to um and this i you know mm. the boys can say better than i can from looking from the outside in it seems to me that they they're not interested in dealing with the issues where, where rugby tends to to deal with it and try to keep on on top of it um and i think i think that is is the difference i think um and it's got to start it's got to start at the very top of the game because unless you set your standards at the very top the kids on a sunday morning or a saturday morning will just do what what their heroes on on much of the day on the saturday night will, will do and that and that filters down so um that's what i think rugby does rugby deals with it a bit better than than football does but there are issues in rugby as well but uh, certainly mm. not not to the extent that there is i think in football so keith to sort of hear a, a point from you on this and then you mark as well what we really need to see from the pgmol now then is and, and i agree with all of this is that we, we there are tough things that have to be done even if it is for really bad behavior inside those um, managerial zones on the touchline. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that Nigel was brilliant at is, well, two things. Uh, the quality of his decisions, his ability to communicate brilliantly. And, uh, you know, I mean, just staying on top of the game, being proactive. Mm. I, I feel that in football at the moment, the referees themselves are reactive. Uh, they're, they're coming in far too late. They're allowing too much to happen. And that has to be, over recent years, the, the lack of leadership and guidance. And if you like, the kick, the boot up the rear of the individual who's not performing. You know, ultimately, at the end of the day, if a referee loses form or is not good enough for that competition, then you have the hard task the PGMOL, to say, right, we're going to remove that individual. But this is down to training, coaching, education. Mm -hmm. We say this on a regular basis. Proactive refereeing is required. Then the authorities have got to recognise that there is a problem and they need to deal with it. You know, five years ago, I chatted with Nigel on a TV show about VAR and what he was predicting and saying at the time has absolutely happened. He talked about that tightrope walker. He mm. talked about lazy refereeing. We've had five years of continuous, lazy, inconsistent officiating. Mm. And some the only people that can do this right is the PGMOL to bring in the right management. Okay. And Mark, for you, away from um, Keith, let's say, or, or the, the, the referees who are all together at the PGMOL, if you if you had a bad one, or you have found that at the time you weren't quite at your your highest level, was there anybody that you, as a top referee, could turn to, or were you expected to sort of just be able to suck it and get on with it? No, I mean, listen, Keith Keith, Keith was my manager. Um, we had a, we had a coach, a dedicated coach. And um, yeah, I mean, listen, we're not we're human. We can't be always at the top of our game. Um, and if if I had a, an indifferent performance, I would I would speak to Keith or I'd speak to my coach, and then he would give me that confidence and and, and to go out and and forget to park that. All the best referees park their indifferent games, park their mistakes, and learn from them, move on, and go on to the next game. But Nigel makes a great point that it starts at the top. It start the discipline starts yeah. at the top. The managers, the players, they have to set the examples. Now, week in week out, we see. We see players surrounding referees, berating referees. Okay, now and all the FA do they hand out they hand out fines here, fines there, fines to all the clubs. Start deducting them points. Yeah, that okay. will then yeah, well, look, that I, will I, then sort I, that will yeah, sort, that no, will I, then start sorting out the discipline. I understand all of that, Nigel. The 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 other great ability that we have as viewers as well um, of rugby matches is that we we can hear the hear what you're saying mm. um which again i think is vital and and that not only helps the referee it makes the you know i guess it's taken a bit of time but those even you know top players at international or top club level they know that they they've got to just watch it a little bit yeah i, I think in in rugby um 
again, probably more so than football, it was needed, it was bought in because it's such a complicated game with a lot of interpretation, a lot of, of you know, some, some rules in football are pretty clear. They're in black and white. There's no ifs or buts about it. In rugby, there's a lot of ifs or buts about the decision which sometimes to a, a referee's interpretation. So it was vital for rugby. You can go into a football stadium for the first time ever, and as long as somebody next door to you explains the offside rule, then you can follow the game of what's happening. In rugby, it's not as simple as that. So it's bought, it's bought in to, to grow the game, to grow the audience and explain. And that has helped. It has helped the decision-making of people understanding. Um, and I think that's probably a bit of the problem with football at the moment, and particularly around the VAR, because people in the stadium and even people at home are mm. sitting there and seeing a decision changed or not given, and they don't understand why. And if there was an explanation of this is why we are disallowing this goal, or this is why we're allowing this goal, or this is why we're giving this decision, then whether you could agree with it or not, people could understand, I can understand no for the decision. So that I think hasn't helped with the issues of VAR in, in football at the moment. And, and I was speaking to somebody in rugby couple, uh, last week about this. Mm. The problem with technology is now, people expect you to be perfect. You can't be perfect. And what will happen is, if you try to be perfect on the field as a player or as a referee, then the perfect becomes the enemy of, of the good. Yeah. All you want the referee to be is to make the good, clear, standout decisions, not the technical one where you have to dissect it within the millimeter or within the inches. They don't want, we don't need that. Yep. You want the big decisions to, to be given. And that's a problem with, I think, with technology in rugby, with TMO and VAR. If you look, rugby, I can put my heart in it and say, the decision-making is not better than rugby now without technology. It's something it's worth. There's a lot more controversy. Every game now in the Six Nations, past the odd one, a lot of rugby games now is all about controversial refereeing decisions. Yeah. If you look at football, there's a lot more controversy around football matches now since the introduction of, of VAR than there was before. So you really have to strip the technology back to minimum to use it so the referee we are still making those decisions and only relying on technology as a last resort, mm. not becoming lazy and relying on technology to do a lot of the decisions. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is contributing a lot. And what happens then is, when you have a lot of this controversy happening in the game, what happens then, particularly on social media, it then encourages the abuse of officials because there are decisions that are becoming controversial and, and right or wrong. It doesn't make the abuse right at all, but it certainly is a factor in it. We are seeing an increase in abuse because we are seeing an increase in controversial decisions in both sports. And just looking at the one difference in the two sports is the clock that stops a lot in rugby that it doesn't in football. They then guess at the end of the game how many extra minutes to put on, I think, half the time. But with that in mind, I also was reading uh, David Walsh the other day, excellent writer in the Sunday Times, that, you know, rugby is now under focus again for the extended time that it takes because of all of these extra things to actually play the game. And do you know where rugby doesn't, it, and it does, it does hinder, it takes away from the game, mm. but rugby has a lot of natural stoppages. So mm. when you do have a stoppage, say for 30, 40 seconds or a minute or so because of injury or a ball goes to touch, you have a natural stoppage, you can check something with your TMO and as long as it's overdone, then it doesn't take away from the game. One of the beauties of football is, one of its many beauties, it's a nice simple game and the flow is important. Mm. You know, football wants that things are moving flowing all the time in football and once you bring in the technology which interrupts the flow and the stop starts of the game it adds on a lot of time at the end of it i was watching one football game last week i'm um, not last week last month i think and yeah. it was something like 10 it said 10 minutes added on time yeah he was still yeah. playing 12 minutes and i was going god what you know what, what's going on here so yeah that that again doesn't yeah. help as well and just one final point from you here thank you very much for joining us nigel and we'd love to get you back again with the boys to to talk more about other things that both sports need uh, to sort out do you feel that um football could ever get to a stage where a trainer wouldn't get in the way of the game if he was to um, come onto the field and tend to a player that didn't have a concussion injury, let's say, that, that rather than this going down now in every mm. single part of the, the pitch just to stop the game and, and help you 
use that as an extra defender, really? Yeah, I, I would think so, because what you have is a lot more space on the football field. So somebody tending somebody in a certain place of the field, you have a lot more space to carry on. Rugby is quite more crowded. Obviously, there are 30 players on the pitch, not, not your 22. So, yeah, it's certainly some... Do you know what I think would help with football a lot? if you had the review process of citing afterwards. So when if you have an issue in the game mm -hmm. on the Saturday, you can review it. The referees, managers, whoever's in charge can, can review it. And they can say, this is, this is cheating. This is ungentlemanly conduct. Uh, this was play acting. Uh, we can prove it here on the review. And for that reason, you are now going to be banned for two or three games. It would help a lot in cutting right. out a lot of the things that are contributing to issues, not just in football, but in rugby as well. Brilliant stuff, Nigel. Nigel, thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, with your expertise and taking time out. Uh, I, I've got some great uh, points being made by uh, um, a lot of the viewers and listeners here. So w hopefully we may well be able to get you back on a, on another occasion. Final yeah, my, thoughts. My, my pleasure. Oh, no, it's been great. Mark, um, in uh, just a few seconds from you, that some great advice there. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Nigel's spot on. I think that we we need, we, we in, in, in rugby, we can hear everything that's being said. We need to hear that in football. We need and, to hear that. Then everybody would respect the decision and understand. And Keith, final thought from you. I think Nigel's spot on. I, 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 I agree with what he's saying. I think that cascade from the top is so important. Brilliant. Keith, Mark, Nigel. That was a good hour, wasn't it? This, my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. <laughs> this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Well. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out. For God's sake, man, well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a... A politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. They can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for the release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there condemn are no the banners, mass. Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march not, when no, we condemn them. No, no, sorry, no. I'm yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you no, can't. Like, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn. What, what is that? What on earth? 
is going on in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. If Richard Soon actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special right. counsel. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> Your mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and Radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a gun. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Nick Easter and George Shute will be joining us to talk about the Six Nations uh, rugby a little later on in this. Uh, and Neil Burns on a fourth test which has swung back India's way. But we're going to continue with football now and Torquay United who have uh, going to, into administration after the owner Clark Cosborne said that he can no longer fund the National League South club. They're in the National League South. They've been owned s since 2016 by Mr Osborne and uh, he bought the club from a fan-led consortium and they've been relegated now to the sixth tier. <laughs> Gary Johnson uh, has left his role as Torquay United manager. Osborne has also stood down as club chairman and the club is set to be deducted 10 points dropping them uh, all the way down uh, to 18th. So where and what can happen to Torquay United? Sam Swan, Torquay uh, Talk YouTube channel and Robin Causley, Vice Chair of Torquay United Supporters Trust, are both joining me right now. Gentlemen, a very good evening to you. Um, evening, th man. Thank you both very much indeed for uh, coming on to talk and tell us exactly where you are. I, I don't know an awful lot about Torquay United except to say that um, for many years I sat next to one of the best commentators I've ever worked with in Jim Proudfoot and he was a massive fan of Torquay United and, and uh, I also remember one of your great stars from many years ago when Sir Alex Ferguson uh, sat in the car park after he'd had a game for Torquay United and uh, opened his car door and ushered him in alongside him to say come with us to Manchester United. You all know who I'm talking about there? Yeah, Lee Sharp. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So come on, um, wh where are we right now? Well, just to say, we're, we're not quite in administration yet. Okay. Uh, thank heavens. Uh, the is is the ground for sale? Uh, no, the ground is owned by the council, so uh, which is a good thing uh, in our view. Uh, so we've got the ground protected, um, but the, the owners looking for buyers at this present moment in time. Uh, the administrators are standing by, uh, but time is running out, obviously, and uh, we're waiting for any signs of interest from any potential buyers. Yeah. So, so one more from you on this particular point as well is that how has it got to this stage? Because was this the case of the owner putting into money into the club, but it just it's never enough? The owner's been putting in some money, as you say, since 2016, for a considerable amount of money. Uh, he had a five year plan initially, uh, which was very much about acquiring a stadium, a new stadium, because he felt quite strongly that, that we needed a, a, a ground that could generate far more income than Playmore could, or, you know, a seven-day week operation to bring money in and make the club sustainable. Uh, he's not been successful in acquiring a stadium, uh, so therefore that big part of his plan uh, has basically been rel relinquished, and um, he's told the, the fans that basically five weeks ago, so something quite majorly happened, which meant he could no longer continue his investment into a club and he would be relinquishing his chairmanship. 
Um, what do you feel as well then uh, on the, the YouTuber the front and everything that you hear from all of this about where the, the next generation coming through are thinking about all of this? Well, I mean, it's it's been such a mix of emotions. I mean, the initial sadness and worry uh, we had when the news broke, uh, but then we've got this this immense pride of seeing our community unite over the last few days and at the weekends. Um, so it's a, such a weird mix of emotions right now. Uh, Talk United have so much potential. Uh, we're in the National League South right now, but we're obviously a proud football league club once. Um, it's a unique area. It's always been an underdog football club. Uh, many stories of near to survival. You know, we've got loads of fight left in us, of course, but it's just been frustrating to obviously see the last few years just the sort of on the pitch, off the pitch, it's not quite worked. Uh, obviously, the playoff finals then to be where we are now, it's just it's just been really tough to watch. But there's, there's so much potential in this club and the place itself, as we showed at the weekend, really. But is there as well, um, and if I could bring you in here, Robin, again, it, does it have the ability to, has it just been mis, financially mismanaged or is there is there more to it than that? Well, when you consider the amount of money that has been put in uh, and look where we are now in terms of, uh, you know, halfway down, uh, you know, the, the Southern League, effectively, mm -hmm. uh, given that we were a league club, it's quite successful league club for a number of years. Given that all that money's gone in, you have to ask what's gone wrong. Uh, you know, we're one of a full, one of a few full time teams. Uh, we've got a, a great ground, a good infrastructure, a very experienced manager. Uh, and yet, you know, you know, for all the ambition, we, we, we failed. We failed on the pitch uh, and we're not succeeding. And I've been supporting the club for nearly 60 years. And this is, you know, the lowest ebb. Uh, you know, we're, we're struggling badly. Uh, there's been a complete disconnect between the owners and the supporters in recent times. Unfortunately, we're getting very angry, very fed up. Mm -hmm. uh, and for some, I, I would say quite a large portion of those that turned up yesterday, which is very heartening to see. Uh, they're quite pleased that there's, there's some change imminent, but of course they're also very worried at the same time. Exactly that. So one more for you on that as well. Do you as a trust have various different plans if you were to go into administration or, dare I say, it, yeah. liquidation or something like this? Absolutely. We have been planning for this scenario uh, uh, for several months now. Uh, we have a, our own strategy group that's been looking for various uh, scenarios that might play out. Uh, obviously we're our close neighbours are Exeter City, which is a, a community club, community-owned club, and a very successful one, perhaps the most successful one of all. So we've been talking to them. Uh, certainly in a, in a worst-case scenario, if we can't find, uh, find any buyers, uh, we will be ready and willing uh, and looking at all the options in terms of taking the club on. Mm. Sam, you're um, a lot younger than myself, obviously, and uh, and Robin. But do you have in, enough of the youngsters who want to come through and and help? Uh, what is you know? I mean, talking the Riviera down there in Devon. I mean, it's uh, it's it's a great place to go. You know exactly. We've got we've got a lot of young fans coming through. It's a big generation that go on the pop side of it. Um, it's, it's a well-supported club, definitely. I mean, it's it's a bizarre football club because we are out, as you say, in the South. A lot of people sort of grow up, move away from Torquay for kind of like job reasons um, and then move back when there's sort of successful football, if that makes sense. And yes, they showed that. Yeah. Um, so if you get those fans on board and the young fans that are down here, you've got a really good chance of constantly hitting two, 3,000. So there is that potential, but fans have just got to feel not like customers. They've got to feel like they have a voice, they're valued. And we felt like that a lot in the last few days. Um, we, it was so nice to see the club united yesterday, but it was also really sad because you know exactly what's going on right now. Yeah. And just finally from you, Robin, do you find that these sort of owners, in a way, they they sort of lead a, a sort of fantasy life of, because it's not the first time he's tried to tried to do things with other clubs like Bristol Rovers and... He's been involved in Speedway and other sorts of things like this. That these people actually, you're never quite sure whether they do have the club's interest at heart. It's not a football person. Uh, he hardly came to any matches. He would admit himself, but he calls, calls himself uh, um, a, a, a person that's interested in motorsport. His interests lie in Speedway and Greyhounds and other developing stadiums, which unfortunately he's never successfully managed to do. Um, so there's no sentiment involved with him. He didn't have the local connection. He didn't have that love for football 
and hopefully uh, somebody will come uh, who has that love. Maybe somebody who is local, maybe not, but they, they need to see the potential of the club, believe in it, uh, and have its best interests at heart. We don't want to get into the same problems again as we've got, we have with the existing owner of the club. Well, Robin and Sam, thank you both very much. We haven't been able to talk too deeply at the moment about this, but love to have you back again. And thank you for uh, joining us here tonight. And we'll keep very much up to date with the future of Torquay United. Time for us to uh, move on, obviously, to rugby right now. And uh, Six Nations, absolutely into it and into the middle of it and everything that's happening. And same old, same old for certain parts of it. Nearly an extraordinary win for Italy against uh, France today and um, let's uh, let's talk if we can to uh, Nick Easter and to George Shooter just uh, just getting the two guys uh, up and ready to go with us just to let you know uh, that the podcast of our middle hour if you only caught bits and pieces of it Nigel Owens the the great uh, rugby union referee uh, joined Mark Halsey and Keith Hackett amongst others uh, Steve Chittenden was there as well to really talk about refereeing in detail in the middle hour that will be our Back of the Stand podcast for Wednesday and uh, everything that you need uh, to know about that you can uh, download it by Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts from and uh, uh, listen to it at your leisure. So Nick Easter and uh, George Shooter are both with me. Hi guys. Evening Mark, how are you? Hello Saggers. Yeah, how very, are you? I'm very well indeed I should think. Uh, before we even talk about anything with what, what happened um, with England and, and Scotland, I mean what on earth was that that Italy France game today? <laughs> I, I must yes. say, I only saw the first half to be honest, so I, I can't really comment too much on that. But over to you, Minnie. Well, I only saw the second half, so uh, <laughs> between you, between <laughs> that's no, a tale of two countries here, haven't we, in their performances? But, um, yeah, yeah, I didn't, I, I just missed the Dante red car, which I think happened early in the second half, yeah. and yeah, Italy had the the entire run of the play. I mean, France, you know, they they still appear, or certainly are, actually hung over from their disappointment in the World Cup and don't seem to be able to get over it. Quite frankly, I know some people might be pointing to the fact that you know, from a home ground point of view, the the, the Stade de France um, is being used to the Olympics, so getting a bit of a makeover and they're moving around. But you know, it's mm. it's 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 a, it's a bit of grass. It's a pitch. You're playing in front of you know. A, uh, fervent home support that have backed you for the last four and a bit years, and they're really struggling to find their mojo. And, and Italy deserved to win. They they did deserve to win. I mean, I did watch mm. only the second half, and you know, apparently France all over in the first half. So maybe I'm I'm wrong in that assumption. But from what I saw, you know, it would have been one for the ages if that kick had gone over. Yeah. So let's uh, let's talk then a little bit in detail now about England uh, at Murrayfield. Um, just reading some of the newspapers and things, same old, same old, and what have you. Let's uh, first of all um, have both of your thoughts, George. If I if, if I could have your th thoughts here first, you know what? Such a good start. Yeah, I, I, Joe, I'm sort of a little bit torn on this. I, I, I like the fact that England have <clears throat> taken a few risks in selection. When I say risks, I mean you know, someone like George Furbank's playing very well week in week out, and and he's a Test player already, so it's not a huge risk. But I like the fact that we've gone away from uh, the, the sort of easy selections of old, uh, and we're trying. We look like we're trying to play a bit of rugby, certainly with the, with the team selection. Um, and I think actually up front things weren't too bad. The scrum was a little bit hit and miss. So, some of that may be down to refereeing interpretations, and you know, that, that first sort of 10, 15 minutes in. Uh, in, in a big game, in, in a tough place to play. Uh, actually, I think England looked looked okay. I mean, they scored a nice try and uh, were 10 nil up after 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but, I mean, just the, generally the, the skill level, particularly of the, of the back line, there just seemed to be some really poor handling, uh, some terrible passing, terrible sort of lines running. Uh, just a little bit, I mean, a little bit, looked a little bit amateurish, to be honest. Uh, you know, you're thinking about these guys, they're full-time professionals training all the time. You don't expect to see those sort of mistakes, even you know, e even on a big stage like uh, Edinburgh in the uh, Six Nations. So I think there's... I don't think you need to pull the trigger too quickly and there's already Steve Borthwick out uh, hashtags yeah. trending on Twitter and all that sort of stuff which is which is fairly crazy really given he's only re in, in his sort of second or well, first full year of the Six Nations yeah. in charge as it were before the next World Cup 
Um, but there needs to be a bit more, certainly needs to be a bit more about England, I think. They just don't seem to be anywhere close to anyone else in attack. Defence, again, I, I get it. They're trying some different things in defence. They're trying to adapt to a new coach who's in his third game in charge. But but still, I just don't see there's really much progress to to, to sort of shout about in, in the first three games of, of this, this tournament, which is a bit of a concern, I would say. So, so Nick, also put this into... Um... Uh, an area that we can all under, uh, understand about this as well, as George has said there. What is it that, uh, where is the skill factor for some of these England players? They've surely got those skills. What is it under the intense pressure of a Six Nations match or a, 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 a World Cup match is so very different to the reasons that they've been picked because of their outstanding play for their clubs? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, two guys that deserve to be picked and probably drop more balls unforced were Ollie Lawrence and George Furbank, who have been pulling up trees for the last six months for their clubs and two clubs that play an attacking brand of rugby on the game line, pressured with the defence in their face. And for me, it asks questions of the whole environment and the buy-in to attack. Now, Steve Borthwick, by his very nature, is, is anti-risk and I applaud the fact he's gone with, you know, I, th I still think there's some players that need to be put out of pasture to be perfectly honest with you, but he's brought in some new faces that deserve it on form. But there was so much evidence in that game, not just as George says, the unforced errors that England will attack in certain areas or at certain times in the game, but actually they don't really buy into it and they'll revert to this box kicking and kicking for territory, which, it's huge in a game of rugby. I mean, everything starts from how you, how you manage your kicking game and your kick, kicking strategy, but it wasn't getting them anywhere. And you just, and you saw them hem up when the pressure came on, they all tightened up, went, went to, you know, the box kick, uh, you know, the, the, the usual modus operandi for, for England. And the thing that I don't buy into um, Saggers and, and George is we always use this excuse with English rugby that the attack takes time to evolve. Well, the All Blacks, when they change their team, don't seem to have a problem. Ireland don't seem to have a problem. France, when they got a hold of, you know, a terrible French generation four years ago, didn't seem to have a problem. And if we look at Tier 2, Fiji and Japan don't seem to have a problem getting a hold of their attack straight away. We always seem to use the excuse of time and, yeah, guys come from different clubs. But as George has said, I mean, some of these errors were absolutely schoolboy, amateurish. Mm. Um, and for me, it's got to be, think, you know, back of your mind, you're thinking... Do the coaches fully give them an environment, fully give them the confidence to play like that? Because that's the only sort of solution or, or answer I can sort of think of for why there are so many basic skill errors. Well, we've got plenty of time to talk about this. We've just got to take a commercial break before that. If any of you heard any uh, trumpet music, it sounded like from my studio. It's down to something that was just happening on one of my computers, but... It's all my fault. It wasn't particularly good. It, I wish it had been a little better than it was. It certainly uh, uh, wasn't up to Nick or George's uh, views. And uh, we've got plenty more from them next here on the Sunday Night Club on Talk TV. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. <laughs> Illness helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet office. <laughs> Three, two, one. Uh, go Browns. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Yes. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. 
he had a a uh, politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which it said yeah. nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent, that's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? <laughs> What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for and the re release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there are no banners, mass. Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march when it comes to the mass. Sorry, no, I'm yeah. sorry. I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you can't. Good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn. What, what is that? What on earth? is going on in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. Richard Soon actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advising you on a special case. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> My your mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Very good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. We're talking Six Nations rugby at the moment. Did I say Nick Easter and George Shute are both uh, with me uh, right now. And uh, looking at England uh, as uh, far as uh, I can tell, I'd like to sort of, for both of you, uh, Nick and George, I'll come to you first this time, George, if I may, is that, what do England really do? It, this is the start of another four-year cycle to the next World Cup. There are all sorts of other bits and pieces that seemingly are going to be sort of dripped in on the way and things like that. The Six Nations obviously are a major tournament, but so too now are all the other bits and pieces that, that players have to be involved in. Should it not just be, though, at the stage here is, you know, get whoever's the England coach, in this case, Steve Walter, you know, pick, pick who you want to now develop and let them do the things that they do at club level, which I know is not easy, but at international level. I'm, I'm thinking here about one or two of the halfbacks and the changes and what have you. They didn't do the sort of things that they would normally do for the likes of Northampton Saints. and, and Yeah, absolutely. Like and again, there's, there's been quite a lot of this on social media this weekend. And uh, I, mean, I think I, we, we were speaking about it during the World Cup and after the World mm -hmm. Cup and before the tournament that actually it's an opportunity now for that, for that clean slate for, for Steve Borthwick and... Uh, and then they go and pick, um, yeah, no disrespect to these guys, but they go and pick Joe Marler, Dan Cole, Danny Kerr, Elliot Daly even, maybe even uh, you could put Itoje in that that category. Guys that probably aren't going to be around for the next World Cup. I mean, again, I, I can't really see Dan Cole playing at 40 years old in in, in the next World Cup. Um, so, uh, yeah, there, 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 there needs to be a question that, and this is a little bit what Eddie Jones did, I think, to a certain degree. He showed faith with a lot of players, and actually their form 
uh, for England and actually some of them for their club wasn't that great. You have to pick people on form. You have to, it's not, it's not, there's no guarantee that you play well for your club that you'll you'll be a fantastic international player. There's no guarantee. The game's far different. There's it's a reason they're called Test matches. It's it's a lot harder than the Premiership. It's a lot harder even than Europe. But if you're not playing well, if you're not playing to the best of your ability week in week out in your club, then there's no way you you can you can actually just turn it on for international. Mm-hmm. And on the flip side of that, if you've if you've been a great player for ten years, there's no there's no guarantee you can keep that going. Even even when the if 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 you play like an all black team or you have a really big crunch test match like a Scotland away at Edinburgh, there's no guarantee you can just turn on. You've got to pick players who are in form, and then you can probably make a sort of decision after 10, 12, 14, 15 test matches. Okay, do you know what this guy's a very good club player, maybe not a test player, and then you can. You sort of not not get rid of them because there's always a chance they'll no. they'll improve over time. But then you you can shuffle your deck a bit more. Um, I think what you can't do is just say, oh, do you know what? We're just going to pick these players because I know them, I trust them. They they play sort of like the game I I like, and then try and get them to play something slightly different when they're playing for England. It's just it seems a little bit like Nick said earlier on. I'm not too sure. Uh, if we're talking too much about the players, maybe we're not talking enough about the coaches. And I mean, mm-hmm. neither us on the ground there at, at, uh, at training sessions, so we don't really know what's going on. But it does look like it's not a particularly well coached team right at this moment. There's not a lot of direction, not a lot of uh, resilience in that team. So, with hindsight, Nick, um, from your so, uh, but give us some uh, sort of um, uh, of your own experiences here. How long would you say it would have taken you to really feel comfortable at international level then? Um, I mean, I made. I on a personal note, I made my my debut at, at 28 years old, and you know it's very different than when you're making your debut at 20, 21, I suppose. And so, from a life experience rather than a rugby experience, you know, you know it's slightly different. Um, and you know, I was willing to grab. You're always willing to grab it. You know, I don't want to sort of like. Of course, I've not been in the position of making my debut in the early 20s, but. You know, I felt that this is the only time. This is the only time to make a mark. Let's go and grab it with both hands. So from my, from my point of view, it was the challenge, as George says. Test match is exactly that. And the biggest thing for me in a test match, Sagas, yes, it was great to represent your country um, and to play with the best players in your country. But it, was, but it was challenging yourself against the best players in the world and the best teams in the world. That that was the ultimate. And that's what you always wanted to achieve as a rugby player. And do you also find, though, that, you know, we talk these days... Oh, I talk to my... Talk to my daughter, actually, she's a psychotherapist and deals with all sorts of different sportsmen and women and, uh, and other people as well at the, at the high end. But she feels that, you know, for men, you, you, the, the no consequence part of the brain doesn't kick in till after you're 25, that perhaps coaches should use that in that, you know, let them make one or two mistakes. They won't feel uh, as bad about it as you perhaps as the coach will if it didn't happen to work on that occasion but it gives them strength for next time when they know exactly what to do yeah well look rugby teams there's got to be a blend there's got to be a blend of youth and experience and guys that are in between as well and probably at the peak of their powers athletically and and mentally and the experienced guys you know could be at the peak of their powers physically but probably mentally more so and and clearly the youngsters from a physical point of view and it's all about getting that blend People mature at very different rates. Different positions as well require, you know, different pressures. Um, you know, there's no doubt about it. You know, the, the sort of the static skills of kicking for goal and, um, you know, throwing in the line out like George did. You know, there's a lot, a lot to think about. It's not suddenly chaos mm. in the moment. It just becomes instinctive and in what you train for. Um, but it's about getting that blend. And the, these guys, you know, they, they, they've got all the tools. You know, yeah. far better tools than than, than we had uh, in our in our era in terms of you know, the psychologists at clubs, the mental preparation, you know, the skill level, the quality of coaching is far better as well in terms of the technical and tactical side. Everyone knows what you're trying to achieve and why you're trying to achieve it. Um, so these guys mature a lot quicker, um, both physically and mentally. But, you know, it comes back to, you know, what sort of style of play do you think will win test matches for England and take England forward in four years? And who are the players that can implement that? Forget about what your game plan and ideal way of playing is. It's not about that. You pick your cattle and then you, you, you drive your direct and involve your game plan around that cattle and around the best players you've got there. And the ones that you earmark and, and, and ID mm. will be world-class players. Because for England to be a force, 
um, you know, in the top four and within a shout of winning the next World Cup, and I hate talking World Cup cycles, but that's what we're talking about, yeah. is you need to have, you know, four or five players who are world class, i.e. in the top three of your position in the world. And at the moment, I don't think we've got one. So how do you go about trying to search for that or, or to get those that uh, you think, George, are close to that, but that you can improve, improve them with uh, only having them for a certain amount of time? Yeah, it, it is difficult. The, the system over here is not structured like it is in Ireland, uh, yeah. New Zealand or, or even Australia and South Africa to a certain degree. Um, yeah, the clubs have the control of the player for 90% uh, of the season. They do have to have rest and that, and, then, and they do have a, a, a period where they can go and train with England. So it's not it's not easy. Of course it's not. Um, but what you what you have to do is you have to adapt. You can't sit there uh, every World Cup finishing third, fourth, fifth, sixth, saying, oh, well, you know what, the system's rubbish. <laughs> we, we can't win because uh, our hands are tied behind our back. You, you've, you've got to find a way out. You've got to, you've got to get around that situation. That And I think that's where we, we can start maybe laying some of the blame at the coaches. Yes, you've got a limited period of time. So what are you doing in that time? Are you trying to do too much? Are you trying to cover everything? Or should you say, do you know what? We've only got, uh, I don't know, a 10-week block over the Six Nations. We've got a 10-week block. Let's make sure that these uh, eight things are, are perfect. We do these eight things better than any other team in the world. Um, and then we'll see where we get to from there. And some of that's got to be... Um, just saying to the players, like, like Nick says there, you, you've got players like Finn Smith, and Mar I know Marcus Smith is injured at the moment. Why don't you just sort of give them a, give them a go and say, look, yeah. just go and play your game. Free reign. Uh, and yeah, I think, as, as you said there, the, the, the players are far more mature these days, a bit more robust perhaps than, than, than people think they are. Um, you know, they're not so, you know, they don't get their confidence knocked so much. Um, but yeah, at the moment, you've got George Ford playing at 10 and he's or 85, 90 odd caps in, into his career. Uh, and he's not running a game, and I'm not blaming him specifically. There's other other issues there, but Nick's talking about those sort of five or six players who uh, have got the experience and potentially could be world class. Well, you'd probably put him in that category to a degree because of the way he has played in the past. But he doesn't look like an 85, 90 cap fly half to me at the moment. He looks like a guy who's surrounded by guys who don't really know what he wants, and uh, and that's that's that why the well one of the reasons yeah. why the game is is not even stalling. It's not even up in gear yet. <laughs> Uh, you, you make some good points there, and, uh, and Nick, is there a is there a case here that at times that, you know, you said I don't want, I don't like talking about the four year World Cup cycle. Um, I agree with that, by the way, on everything. I think it, it you know, you, you you still want other players who in that third fourth year possibly, who who are, are suddenly be showing something that they never showed before in club rugby and and could be part of something that you want to do. But but is there a sort of safety first? part of coaches at this level that stops some of the younger individuals um, ever really doing what they want for as long as they should do um, or that we perhaps think that longevity is something that uh, shouldn't perhaps exist if you're not still managing to do what you were brought in for which your talent showed you had that you can't perhaps do after five six years it's, uh, you you know that's it you, you you get a four year cycle you do the best you get an opportunity because you were great or even a, a second one but not everybody that there's too there's too much too much um uh, of all of this of the coaches sort of holding everybody back yeah look, i mean i think the first thing probably i said um which was so disappointing result is yeah you know, the england england head coach after the All Blacks head coach is is the most pressurised uh, head coach <clears throat> job in rugby, yeah. and so and allied to that, international rugby is about winning. It's about the here and now. Let's make no bones about it. It's yeah. about winning. So if you put those two things together, you can understand or see where the thinking is in keeping a few older guys that know how to win Test matches or can you know draw their experiences to you know, help the youngsters learn in the camp. But at the end of the day, you've still got to be able to do the job, right? You can't be a passenger, especially with 23 people now available. Yeah. However, what Steve Borthwick and his coaching team have got now is they have actually got a license to blood these players. The support base in England was so put off with English rugby and lost its connection in the, the latter stages of the Eddie Jones era that, you know, we, we obviously he got fired a year before the World Cup. Steve Borthwick came in and 
if people can see what our identity is or what we're attempting DNA or we're wanting to get you know bums off seats, even though that might not be the most pragmatic way to win a rugby match, that they'll that you know you'll have you'll have a little bit more um, time on your hands, you know, a bit more of a stay of execution as far as that role is concerned. Because the RFU starts up, the RFU have said they back him for the, for the next four years. Yeah. They've said we back you for the next four years, but at the moment, you know, the pressure's coming on because. As, as George says, you know, we're not even getting out of gear to put in a performance. Whereas if you can actually see the ember, you know, the sort of like the green shoots of an attacking game, if you like, or it doesn't matter whether it's just a set piece and a really good kicking game, you know, to, to be honest. But, you know, I know we want to see more ball in hand because, you know, you look at Ireland and France, the way they play and the All Blacks and everything, we know that's the way rugby you know, is played a lot more now and, and with success. But if we actually saw something like that, he has got a stay of execution that I don't think, certainly in a recent past, an England head coach has had. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was around when, you know, Andy Robinson got sacked, Brian Ashton came in for, you know, a year and a half, then Martin Johnson came in, he did three or four years. Stuart Lancaster had four years. You know, Steve Borthwick's got the stay of execution of five years. And what happened in the, you know, the sort of latter stage of Eddie Jones's tenure is he's got a lot more patient English supporters and media. But... Yeah. We need to it's, see what you're trying to do. It's a totally different game to international football. But for me, Gareth Southgate uh, is, a, is, is the sort of classic one who has got a lot of fair players. They'll get ahead in all these games <clears throat> at the high end of the games in semi-finals and finals of Worlds and European Cups. <clears throat> they show really great promise and they score early in semi-finals and finals. And then instead of going on and and going for the absolute throw, he then has them all, drags them all back again, and in the end, they they end up losing it. Could that be the case if you don't let some of these youngsters who've got absolutely raw talent just have a go for a while and see what happens? George? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you, have to look, you have to look to football to see. I think Warren Gatland and, and Wales is a pretty good example. I mean, I know they've, they've lost games and... But I think it's exactly what Nick was saying there. You can actually look at the Welsh and say they've they get a bit of an identity. They've, they've had some huge players, some of their greatest ever players retire uh, even before the last World Cup. But they made a pretty good show of that World Cup. Everyone wrote them off. They weren't going to get a chance, and you know, they, they they had their worst game against Argentina in the quarterfinals. Otherwise, they could have been in a World Cup semi final. Um, and then this this Six Nations, everyone had written them off again. Uh, and Warren Gatlin has somehow managed to galvanise a, a group of young players that everyone, no one's heard of. I mean, even the captain, probably no one really outside of Wales would have genuinely thought that the, 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 this, the squad that was named would actually make a splash in the tournament. But they, they could have beaten England. I mean, the, the score uh, this weekend against Ireland was flattering to Ireland. I think 17-0 uh, at half-time and... Uh, 77 at half time, I think it was. And if the Welsh had scored after half time and, and they had quite a bit of pressure, that sort of inexperience showed there. But if they'd scored there, mate, I think Gatlin said this as well. If they mm. if they got a point, got a, got a try or so out of there, then suddenly that game is very different. Ireland showed their quality and scored two tries later on and, and, and killed them off. But yeah, you, know, you can if you're a Welsh right now, you're probably feeling okay because you've got a, a very young squad of players, a very young captain, uh, and they're they're getting stuck in. They look like they want to be there. They're, 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 they're playing out their skins at the moment in, in many aspects of the game. Mm. Uh, where, where England, I'm not, I'm not accusing England of, of not trying. That's, that's wrong. No, no. I, I probably would never do that uh, to a professional sports team anyway. No. But they do look at sixes and sevens. You, you can't tell me that that Welsh team is not uh, outplaying this English team. This, I don't care what the result was last week or two weeks ago, rather. So that, that's, that's a pretty good comparison and you know your you, Gareth Southgate in England is, is pretty good as well but you don't say you don't have to look too far away to realize what actually England could be trying to achieve hmm. and a final thought from you uh, Nick is uh, what do you do then if you're Steve Borthwick for the rest of this Six Nations do you let them off the, the lease a little bit more they allow them to play more in the way that they perhaps do at club level that have first interested the selection of them into the international team or do you have to think we've got to win another game this season no um the uh i think i think you've got to blood the youngsters i think you've got to play finn smith at 10 um i think that fire Waboso's proven that uh you know he's going to be a bit of a handful as well and he's the sort of player that you know we've got ireland and france next that you need that power and go forward 
Ollie Lawrence has got to be given time. Furbank's got to be given time as well there. Same as Freeman in the backs. I'd love to see George Martin start. I know he's been coming back from injury, but you, you've got to give all these guys... You know, I suppose the, the only guy that performed yesterday um, from the previous eras, if you like, was Sam Underhill. And so you keep him in there, you, you know, because he's performing. And ultimately, that's what it's about. You've got to do the job. You've got to be the best at doing that job with what we're trying to put, um, put out there. Um, so I would blood all of them because, as I said, he's got free reign now. These guys have got to get as many experiences as possible. It's going to hurt. You know, people go back to 2003. There was the 98 tour of hell, wasn't there? You know, where a lot of them were on that. Um, and, you know, they learn from those experiences and learn pretty quickly. And you, and you learn fast. You know, the, the higher the level you are in failure, you learn fast. And look, no one's expected to do anything as Ireland and France. Let's be honest, we've won two out of five for the last, I think, three or four or, or yeah. three out of the last four Six Nations. And it was Italy and, and Wales, I think, most of the time as well. So, you know, that we, we, we'll just be on a par in terms of the results are concerned. But what we need to see is that these guys are actually being thrown in there. Yeah, it's into the bear pits, into the lion's den, but it's sink or swim, isn't it? And that only then are you going to find a little bit more about what you're trying to achieve. Exactly that. Nick and uh, George, thank you both very much indeed for your expertise. And uh, we'll no doubt speak again as the Six Nations uh, develops and tough games for England to come. We're talking cricket next. England finding it tougher than, well, perhaps as tough as it, it should have been. And what can they do about it at the moment? Not a lot in this fourth test. Republic of Mike Graham. Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Nice. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> and they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? <laughs> What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for the release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there condemn are no the banners, mass. Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march when we come down with the mass. Sorry, no. I'm yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you no, can't. It's good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth? is going on in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. If Rishi Sunak actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised yeah, by a special case. Right. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh. what? <laughs>
Your mouth. mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. <laughs> this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Time to talk about uh, a test series which has uh, just been extraordinary so far, start to finish, hasn't it? Uh, expertise of Neil Burns has been a delight, of course, throughout the series, as always. Neil, uh, good evening to you. And uh, perhaps just seeing after another incredible day of cricket that it, England... Um, up against it now when it comes to whether they're somehow going to still get out of uh, taking it and hoping to have got somewhere so that they could have gone to the last test match still in with a chance of winning the series. Yeah, good evening, Mark, and good evening, everybody. It's been the most absorbing test match of what has been a brilliant test match series. But unfortunately, as things stand, it looks like unless we get a Bob Willis type miracle, from Headingley in 1981, where he took eight for 43. I can't see England coming back in this game. And unfortunately, it will mean they'll go to Dharmashala for the last game with England 3-1 down in the series, as opposed to it being 2 all, which I think it should have been if we were able to capitalise on the brilliant innings played by Joe Root mm. in the first innings of this Test match. Just l looking at that second innings as well, I mean, the... Is it as as fair to say that the the, the 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 spinners for India really got more out of the pitch? Well, I think that's to be expected because they're much more experienced and they are f of far higher quality. We've got a part-time spin bowling Joe Root. We've got um, a young off spinner in Shoa Bashir who's playing his eighth first-class match in his second Test match. And whilst Tom Hartley has bowled well at times and bowled brilliantly in the first test match uh, to take seven wickets, fundamentally uh, inexperienced bowlers cannot sustain their accuracy uh, over extended periods of time. And I think against quality players of spin bowling like India have got, mm. then that's been proven. But the biggest disappointment for me uh, in today's play was that we were in great shape with the bat and we should have really put them out of sight and we lost our last five wickets for not many runs. And uh, there are so few people who were really there to support the contribution um, initially of Zach Crawley. Um, I thought Johnny Besto played well for a period of time. Yeah. I thought Ben Folks played well, but to lose the last five wickets for virtually nothing was very disappointing. And then at the end, I still thought we had a chance mm. if we bowled well with a new ball. But I was amazed that Jimmy Anderson wasn't given a new ball and instead... Joe Root was used, which I thought was a was a big error. Yeah, it was it it was it, in a way very different again, which just shows the complexities and uh, of Test cricket, wasn't it? That sort of we didn't see England lose wickets because of expansive play here. We saw them because they were beaten by the skill of the the the, the Indian spinners, really. Yes, I think it says a great deal about the quality of the Indian spin bowling. First of all, uh, Ravi Ashwin. Uh, hearing him talk at the close of play about how in the east part of the country the ball doesn't bounce as much as he's used to. So he, rather than actually having overspin on the ball, he, he undercuts the ball and tries to do people with yeah. balls that slide on <clears throat> and looks to get people out uh, LBW more. Um, but I thought Kuldeep cool bowled brilliantly too. And um, I mean, the ball that got Ben Stokes, I thought was just fantastic. He just drifted in to his pads and then spun away in the way that Shane Warne bowled some brilliant leg breaks as a right-hander down the years. Mm -hmm. But India seemed to not only produce some wonderful spin bowlers, but they've got some really good seam bowlers these days. And this series has also unearthed some brilliant young batsmen too. And it might be that Jai Swal is the guy who wins the game for them tomorrow. We really need to get him out with a new ball in the morning.
There are other bits and pieces, aren't there, as well? And, you know, wicketkeeper batsman here and Jurel, who's only in, really, isn't he, because of uh, other, other problems at the moment. That, that staying there overnight when they were seven down was vital, wasn't it? It was. It was a very intelligent and cultured innings. Yeah. Uh, and Ben Folkes has done that on a number of occasions mm -hmm. in his career. Shepherded the tail brilliantly, but it also says something about the bowling as well. You know, successful cricket teams have bowlers who strike with a new ball up front and dismiss the opposition's best players early on, but also have bowlers that uh, come back and knock over the tail cheaply. Um, so I, I think um, whilst it was wonderful for Shah Bashir to get five wickets, it was just a shame that we couldn't have had a bigger first innings league because at that stage uh, we were really in command of the match and I think it also is a uh, an example of where the England cricket team is at at the moment in that mm -hmm. it is promising, it gets itself into good positions but doesn't always close them out. It has some really good days but doesn't necessarily have consecutive good days to win matches and when we do play well in a match, win a match, we don't do it consistently enough throughout a series so um, I think Ben Stokes and Brendan McCullum will be delighted on this tour that some young players have, have performed well but what we need is people like Zach Crawley who's had a really good test match here mm -hmm. to actually go on and make a big century and, and make it count. <clears throat> And, and and with that in mind as well, for the likes of Show uh, Bashir and and others too, the five test series, uh, I don't care what anybody says, is is particularly great for, let's say, England in India, India against Australia, possibly another big series like this. That, you know, there are so very rare occasions that these England spinners will perhaps get the opportunities that they've had here in India so much in the future that perhaps we should still look at restructuring a bit and the five test series now and again are fantastic they are and it offers an opportunity for narratives to develop where individual bowlers really get a hold over a particular batsman i think of down the years how glenn mcgrath used to get michael atherton out on a regular basis <laughs> and then by the time you get to the fourth or fifth test match it's almost like you just much as, as hard as you try, you kind of know the individual's got the wood over you. Um, but I think the opportunity that this test match um, has offered England and the one that they haven't taken is that Jasper Bumrah has been rested because it's a five-match series and yeah. the nature of back-to-back -back test matches means they're very tiring both physically and mentally and obviously Virat Kohli hasn't been playing either. So there was a great opportunity for England to beat a, an understrength Indian team but what's been most impressive has been the way that other players have really come to the fore in the Indian team. And tomorrow, you know, there's still a lot of cricket to be played. We don't know how this pitch is going to play based on how it played on the first morning on day one. You'd have thought the game may not have gone three days. No. It's been a, a good test match pitch, but it still might have a few surprises in it tomorrow. And it might be that one or two balls keep low. And if Anderson and Robinson and Shoa Bashir can bowl accurately enough and build pressure on the Indian batsmen, there still may be a few more twists and yeah, turns I'm, in this fantastic... I'm, ple I'm pleased you've said that. I mean, basically, you nearly would say, wouldn't you, to this England side tomorrow, look, we just don't know. Let's, let's give it a go here. We, this pitch could still help us. Yeah, and unfortunately tonight, uh, um, this morning, which is the end of the... Yeah. Uh, the session for on day three, we bowled poorly and gave them too many full tosses and therefore it doesn't matter what the pitch is like because it gets taken out of the equation if the ball doesn't land on it. Um, showed the inexperience, particularly of Tom Hartley and, and the lack of quality that is in Joe Root's bowling. Tomorrow morning, we absolutely have to bowl our best bowlers. And for me, that will be Robinson and Anderson up front. Um, and then hopefully Bashir can follow up what was an excellent first innings performance with another good performance second time round. And the other thing is the quality of the catching round the wicket has to be yeah. absolutely top class too. Yeah, absolutely. Neil, thank you as always very much indeed for uh, your expertise. Neil Burns with the very latest on this wonderful test series uh, with uh, England with it all to do tomorrow.
Well, uh, that's it's been a fantastic Sunday Night Club, and I know that you, well, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have bringing it to you as well. Don't forget the podcasts. Our first podcast uh, will be tomorrow, uh, if you get it on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you download your podcasts. Uh, back of the stand will be there, and then on Wednesday we'll have more of an in-depth look at our middle hour, as always, which was... Uh, Terrific with uh, great football and uh, rugby union referees talking about the state of refereeing and how the game perceives them as well. You won't want to miss that on Wednesday. So, Howard Hughes. Ah, yes, Mark. How are we? (laughs) Very good. Um, You know, if my dad was still here, he'd be a very happy man tonight. You know why. Uh, Because of Liverpool. Yeah, yes. (laughs) Of course. A a lifelong Reds fan. A quadruple is still on. Yeah, no, we, by the looks of it. I mean, he would be so <laughs> pleased. I'll never forget sitting with him uh, probably about a decade ago um, and we sat and watched as Liverpool put five past Manchester United yeah. at Old Trafford. <laughs> but that's um, a long time ago. I mean, I was never really into the football like he was, but he was um, you know, a real dedicated fan. You don't know about that, though. You want to know about the contents of the unexplained. I do. And there's a lot of mystery, suspense, imagination and all kinds of things tonight. Um, I'm not going to give you all of it because probably we go over time. So uh, we're going to talk about some remarkable UFO sightings over Canada. And we've got the air traffic control recordings uh, of the pilots who reported them, including one who said, um, in my 15 years of night flying, I've never seen anything like this. So we'll talk with uh, an expert about that, Chris Rutoski. Uh, We'll talk with Dr. David Whitehouse about... um, some solar flares that are hitting Earth probably round about now. I hope it doesn't uh, take us off the air, but that's that's the way it is, as they say. And also that moon mission that yes. hasn't gone quite as smoothly as they claimed at the beginning. So that's with David Whitehouse. We'll talk about nuclear fusion this week. Robert Zubrin from the Mars Society will be here to talk about their recruiting. They want to do a mock up of living on mock up a mock up of living on Mars, right? Yeah. So uh, we're going to talk about that, how that might work, and the kind of people who might want to go there. Um, also, using AI to read ancient scrolls. Uh, we have a world first on the show tonight. Some unique Pascagoula tapes, some recordings from the actual era, some recordings.